Jesus, I forgot about the fucking traffic outside. All right, let me just mute the microphone real quick. See, the thing is, I actually want to put this on YouTube later, so I actually have to strongly consider what kind of music I want to play. I just about to play something that might be copyrighted, and I realize that I don't want the world to be muted, so that doesn't make any sense. That's a bad idea right there. Um, so yeah, we're gonna go with this playlist, and hopefully everything is perfectly fine. Uh, and it should be, right? What's the, what's the reason it shouldn't be? We should be perfectly willing, or perfectly able to proceed. So, last minute checks, I have not done my latency check on my brushes, that is a big problemo because, yeah, you know, it's, it's good to have a bit of comfort while you paint, but that's alright because you're still going to be able to get something half decent, as long as the principles are okay. People override convenience a little bit too much, you don't need convenience to make a good piece, you need convenience to make a good piece comfortably. But then comfort's not always a requirement when, when painting, because I've seen people use the most absurd mediums and still end up with a fantastic painting at the end of it. It's like, uh, you know, the old adage, adage of the, they say, you know, you can paint anything in Microsoft Paint or something. Um, it's true, I could paint anything in Microsoft Paint, right, given enough time, because it's just pixel modification at the end of the day. Like, if you give me 50 years, I can go with a single pixel modification brush and then adjust everything and then get a perfect image, right? A, a crystal clear, you know, photographic quality image. But nobody wants to do that, right? Because again, the, legitim the legitimacy of an art piece doesn't reside in the amount of encumberment encountered while making the art piece. It's always about, you know, the piece itself at the end of the day. How good is it? How quickly did you do it? Because the quicker you do it, the more you can do, all right? These kind of ideas. We toss these ideas around all the time, but they're good ones. They're good to reiterate. Always good to keep in mind. All right, with that said, let us go on to the screen. There we go. Okay, so we added another tiger boy to our little list of tigers there. He's so gorgeous. Look at him. He's looking up at us. I did this yesterday before my dog's surgery. Um, and actually, I uploaded this when he was in surgery. So that was kind of funny. Um, <laughs> my, uh, my mom joked that you should take a picture of the dog while he's on the operating table in case he fucking dies. My family has a bit of a slightly morbid sense of humor. 
but we should be pretty good to proceed. So we have a question on the Reddit. Speaking of Reddit, I need to make my own Reddit at some point. We already discussed this in the last stream, but I think it's a fantastic idea, and I should certainly explore that in the future. However, uh, a person named Radio Runner is having a bit of a, not, not particularly a problem, but um, they are delving deeply into the idea of shape simplification, and they did a painting based on this reference. So I'm not going to crit the painting because, I mean, I can, but. Um, I don't know if I have explicit permissions, so I don't want to just put people's work on here if they're not comfortable with it. However, uh, he has provided me with the reference, so we should be able to slightly disamb disambiguate this. So I approach others by, well, on my trade, but by habit, I do more portraits than anything else. Uh, not these days, these days seem to be more animals and armor. But yeah, I have a lot of experience doing portraits, so this shouldn't be too difficult to do. This uh, 3 fourth angle of the face, very dreaded angle, a lot of difficulties can be encountered because the, the real weight upon your shoulders to try and get a lot of things right uh, is probably, it's probably the, at its peak when it's at a 3 fourth because there's so many things to consider. Consider that slight little foreshortening on the eye, and consider the exact way the nose is going to protrude from the face. And the biggest, biggest mistake that everybody and their mother gets wrong, which is the far side of the face always a bit too protruding. Now, when we did our studies for proportion, time and time again, we did see, when we did a trace comparison, the way that I studied proportion is that I learned measurement, and measurement is a really big, vast subject. But I learned it, uh, well not learned, um, period, but I learned, was in the process of learning it for about a hundred and a hundred of the hours. And I noticed predominantly in the 3 4 this is ba basically where everybody goes wrong. So either the angle of the head is a little bit too angled that away, a bit too much, or the angle of the cheek is a bit too angled that away. So it's almost like the, the, the head gets a bit too, a bit too slanted in this direction. But we want to avoid that happening, we don't want that in our pictures, because again, we want things to really conform to our idea of what realism actually is. And then from there, and this is a really powerful thing, if ever you want to get quicker with painting faces, learning construction is a really powerful thing, because the idea behind a lot of paintings, and paintings for time, is that you're not just seeing something on the reference and then basically copying that into your painting, it's that you know what you expect. So I don't expect the eye to be like way higher than, you know, a perceivable boundary. So if this is the brow line and this is the nose line, I don't expect the eye to be anything lower than maybe a third-ish, you know? Unless it's a very like distorted image, or, you know, I can't imagine, or, you know, maybe it's a deformity or something. Beyond that, as far as a regular human being goes, there are certain algorithmic rules that you can always follow, and those will most likely kind of train your hand. Um, so you don't make like, these absurd little claims on the canvas which you have to correct for later. And if you work within those like, miserable parameters, it's going to end up with a much quicker image because again, you're not drawing one is to one, you're not always a slave to your reference. More, you, the reference kind of just points you in the right direction and you're able to proceed from there. It's a bit of a, a, bit of a thought about just drawing faces, just drawing anything quicker. Having that literal information is so much more powerful because while it's perfectly fine painting from reference, understanding the structure of it outside the reference is almost equally important, especially in the subject of speed. So you want to be able to construct things regardless, but being able to do something from imagination or being able to construct something from imagination, it makes your paintings from reference so much better because, again, you kind of understand exactly what you're painting so that every mark that you make is done with such a crazy amount of authority. That really helps. Okay, but with that said, let's uh, paint this. So we need to talk about shapes for a second, uh, just before we continue, because again, this painting is about going to be majority about um, about the shapes and the shape design and the values associated with those shapes. So it's uh, it somewhat behooves us that we need to do this right now. Let me quickly do a latest check because uh, Krita seems to be dying on me. I'm gonna be a little bit concerned about exactly. This looks like. Also, the audio is ridiculously loud. Okay, let me adjust that really quickly. I didn't realize how loud that was. That's my bad. As is usually the case, I don't uh, hear things the same way that you guys will. Uh, okay, I just made a quick adjustment. We should be okay. Alright, cool. Uh, let me just check and see if anything's severely occupying my memory. It seems like Google Chrome is going absolutely insane. Let me just shut that down real quick. Ooh, that's uh, that's kind of ugly. <laughs> that's a good bit of latency there. Uh, let's do a couple of changes on this canvas really quickly. The first thing is I want to reduce the canvas size. 
because again i don't sell any of my work so it's fine i don't, I don't really care if the end result is a bit too pixelated that's perfectly okay i can leave the larger canvases for my off-stream work and uh, we can even forego the usage of the brushes that we usually use because i use some pretty hardware intensive brushes when i paint offline like all of these are done with the uh, atelier set on Krita, and those ones are somewhat highly hardware intensive so it's a bit of a problem uh, a quick little note about this reference is that it's a lot of empty space i don't really like how um, that works compositionally i mean it's probably a still from a from a movie because it's got what i assume to be a 16 by 9 ratio and that's that's fine a lot of uh, people would recommend you paint in 16 by 9 that's totally okay um but for the purposes of a portrait we don't need all that extra space so we can just forego it um so let me quickly get the music back running and while i wait for everything to load on the chrome side i am going to crop this image so that it's a bit more usable so we quickly grab it into Krita. I use Krita, by the way, if you guys uh, are wondering the program. It's a free program. Highly, highly recommend it. So I'll just quick, do a quick little crop. I can even go a little bit more extreme. I do like a little bit of space, though, between the hair and the boundary. Just a bit of breathing room sometimes. It's not bad. All right, let me just save that. I'll, I'll override it. I don't, need the, I don't need the original file. That's totally okay. Okay, we grab the new one, put it in here, and I have this for future reference if it's all I want to somehow, for some reason, get that composition back. Okay, so we should be pretty good to go. Uh, we're gonna do this in a very, very standard way. I'll still be using my usual one layer thing, but we should be fine uh, other than that. Okay, let me get the music back running, hopefully, and we don't have extreme issues with latency. Punta, how's it going, man? You having a good, uh, a good night? Good to see you. Just, uh, I had some time in the morning, and I was gonna just do this off stream, just do a recording, but it's easier this way because I don't have to do any post editing or stuff like that. I can just. Uh, I can just hit the button on Twitch and then go straight to the YouTube. I've got a very... I've got a decent question on the Reddit, so I just wanted to make a video or something about it. Um, probably still have a stream later today. I don't know about that, because I might be really busy today evening. Uh, but at least, at least there's going to be something. And I'm probably going to be just continuing painting for a while, doing my usual work. Um, might even do my studying uh, in the morning as opposed to in the afternoon. Hey, Beastie, how's it going, man? Good to see you. All right, let me just get the music back in and then we can continue with this painting. It's going to be kind of cool. We'll talk a little bit about the shapes because that's a big thing. That's a, it's a big, big thing to talk about. Isn't it like 2 a.m.? It's not 2 a.m. It's, uh, it's closer to 8 in the morning. I, I already had a full night's sleep, so I'm doing fine. Coffee Jazz is my music playlist. Dude, D2, you're still awake? You're a monster. Look at this dude. He's insane. Yeah, I'm running, I'm running pretty hot right now, because I didn't sleep yesterday, I was up for maybe 48 hours, because uh, my dog had surgery in the afternoon, and <laughs> there's no way I'm going to attempt sleeping with something like that the next day. So I just, uh, that's why I did these tiger studies. I just slammed them uh, one after the other, like bam, 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 bam. And uh, yeah, they actually went pretty well. I did this one uh, yesterday afternoon. Yeah, but these have been really fun to do, I've been uh, a big fan. Because tigers historically have not, um, I haven't had the greatest relationship with them uh, because they have complex surface detail, which is the bane of my existence sometimes. But I'm getting better at my understanding of how to achieve this quickly. And quickly is always the name of my game. I very much do not want to be sitting and trying to attain a likeness after three or four hours. I just want to get that likeness over with and I can always just render later on if I choose to. But I very seldom choose to because I know I can do it. I don't really mind. Ninja, how's it going, man? Getting ready to see all the people post from TwitchCon? Hell yeah. Dolphin Tigers. My favorite kind of oceanic feline. But good to see you, Ninja Mate. We're just uh, answering a question from the Reddit. So, uh, I had a good bit of fortune, if you guys aren't, uh, if you guys didn't know, about uh, a post that I made for the digital painting subreddit. I got a thousand, like a thousand three hundred or a thousand two hundred upvotes on something, and I got a bunch of fucking questions. And in that, one of the questions was about shapes, and I thought I'd just make a... Let's make one of the paintings for shapes. So that's a good question, because I haven't really dealt very strongly about the subject of shapes. Uh, and I think it's a good thing to think about. One, one of the biggest game changers in my work, because I wasn't very privy to the concept of shapes when I first started painting, and it's a very, very important thing. If you're not thinking about it, your work's going to suffer. It's going to suffer severely, because it's one of those foundational criteria to make something look like something else. Alright, with that said, let's talk about the shapes over here. So start really simply what is the shape 
A shape is a two-dimensional confine which describes three-dimensional shapes and their response to light, three-dimensional forms and their response to light. What does that really mean? It's a lot of complicated, unnecessary jargon. What that means is that if I add a dark in this sort of shape, in this really curvy kind of kind of shape over here, it implies a few things. It implies that this is facing away from the light source. It's implying the texture in the transition. It's implying that this part over here, it tends to round in this way. So basically, if you were to just draw this shape out, it would look like a like a continent, right? It would look like like a landmass on Earth. It wouldn't look like it wouldn't look like hair. But in the context of this, alongside the light shape on the other side, that's what creates the illusion of form. And that's why shapes are so important because you have to realize that if you do any of these things improperly, it busts the entire read of the painting, right? It busts the entire read that you have. For instance, if for whatever reason you chop off this area and you simplify over, then suddenly she's not going to have as much of a volumetric notion, right? Because suddenly it'll look like she has hair that's kind of flowing back. It'll still read as hair, mind you, but it won't look like it's going all the way up to the front, which means that there's a bit of a cohesion inconsistency with the hairline. But that's not a very big deal. It is a bigger deal, however, if, for example, you just put a straight line here, just like that. That's a problem, right? And you will see me actually paint this with a straight line to begin with, uh, but I will update that, mainly because of the idea that you want to give the notion of this flowing in a very staircase kind of fashion. So that's what shape really does. And shape is, the, I think, the foundation for the most amount of styles in all painting and all art, right? Because you could say value for realism, but really when it comes, it comes to something like impressionism, HDR painting, um, just a bunch of uh, regular like realism variants, semi-realism is all really about the shape. Um, even when it comes to like manga style stuff, even though they don't put as many shapes on the face, I mean, the, the body rendering is, at least these days, it seems to be quite, quite high on the uh, on the shape density. Like looking at something like One Punch Man, for example, like the shapes on the bodies are just so beautifully designed. I'm painting trees right now. Hell yeah, Punta. Get at it. So what are the shapes that we need to consider? So we can't talk about shapes in realism without talking about values. So we'll talk about the values first, talk about the proportion first, and then we'll go into the shapes. So, why do we need the proportion? We need the proportion to be able to confine our shapes in a very legible, legible manner, which kind of tells us that, okay, this is going to be roughly a woman, a female feminine shape, you know, in a particular angle. So that's giving us a bit of a, a room to play around with certain things, right? So that's why we kind of block in things to begin with. But you don't need to do this, right? Because you've seen me do so many paintings in the past where I don't really do any proportioning. I don't do any blocking. I just jump into the shapes directly. But so just for the sake of like consistent output, the first thing that we're going to do in this painting is we are going to figure out what this outside contour is because I like working within the outside contour. It keeps things a lot more consistent and it's easier to work with, right? That's why you'll see a lot of artists, they start with a line art. I don't particularly do line art. I don't like doing it because I do paintings half the time which don't involve line at all. So this is the way that I think about it. And I have a lot to say about the subject, about wasted strokes, but there's no sense making a finished line drawing if my lines are not going to make it to my final drawing or my final painting. Like, what's the point? Uh, because if it's going to be covered with paint later on and I don't need it to get a good read on the features, it's completely pointless to put a perfect line drawing on top of this. Now, uh, there will be disagreements uh, with this from a lot of artists, so I'm, I'm not going to say that any of them are wrong, but I can't, um, I can't make my case with any less amounts of, of ferventness. Uh, I don't think like incredible detail line drawings make any sense to do a quick painting. There you go, Punto. Same for oils as well, by the way. Now, the definition of what's enough line work can really depend on the artist. Like, I've seen Andrew Tischler, who is a traditional painter. He does thumbnails, and you should have seen the strength at which I did an air quotes just now. His thumbnails are better than my finished paintings. So, it really depends, but the point is, is that don't waste time in things that aren't going to show up, right? In my opinion, the definition of a wasted stroke is a stroke that is not going to show up in the final image and a stroke that doesn't help you get to the final image. And you'd find yourself, if you really go without logic and you analyze your paintings, and all of us are streamers, right? So, and I do this all the time for my own work because I'm always curious about what I did because I want to make a mental note after my stream. So when I'm painting after my stream, I put my vod up uh, sometimes and I look at what I'm doing and I'm like, wait a second, why the why would I put five strokes there? Why could I have just done it with two? Like, why did I put a black there when there was a white in the final image? Like, what's the point? And this is like a good way of thinking about it. And that's what I attribute the majority of my speed gains uh, to because if you want to be more intentional, like the craziest thing to me when I first started painting was the fact that I could spend one hour on something and somebody could spend the same amount of time and their painting looked like 95% more complete than mine. 
but we had the same time and i guarantee we almost did the same amount of strokes like i i apply it quickly like you hear me do this when i <laughs> when i paint i have a very quick apl application but it's not really that much quicker when you think about it than most people so if i'm applying paint at the same at the same pace the same frequency as somebody else and i spend the same time how in the fuck is somebody painting quicker than me right and the idea is the everything is done for a purpose it's more intentional it's more purposeful and that's the idea of getting faster that's the idea okay going a little bit more i'm going a little bit more into the idea of what we're painting so we're going to get the outside contour first and then i'm going to paint something called majority i don't think i've heard anybody else use this term it's something that i guess i um uh, it's just something that i think about for myself but when people do block-ins i have a bit of a pet peeve when people do block-ins for instance if i'm going to do this and i'll do it in a, in a rough right i'll do a rough block of this so if I was going to block this in, I don't see any sense in doing something like this. This is just efficiency stuff, but you know, it's good to talk about. I don't see any sense in doing something like this. And the reason is this, is that there is no chance in hell the value in this particular area of the painting is going to be even remotely close to the value that's going to be the end. Because this is a, it's a very light value in whatever context you want, it's a very light value. And the actual true value of this is closer to the darkness, right? So it makes sense to do something like this, maybe, you know, just so it's visible. It's, it's clear, but this makes no sense because it's, it's light and this saves me a bunch of time in the blocking uh, because you realize that every stroke that you make that's not going to really make it in is a stroke that's working against you in the timer. So it seems like a very simple thing, but it really, really matters and it's incredible how much I myself and so many other artists, they seem to just gloss over this idea. They don't, they don't paint it. So I'm strictly talking about um, illustration from reference. Uh, it's a big deal because you know what's going to go there so why would you like why would you mess around uh why don't you just put the dark in there to begin with anyway a bit of an efficiency thing but i like painting majority and this this idea this concept it it spans everything basically for instance one of my biggest problems in painting tigers was that i never got the stripes to look the way that i wanted at the end of my timer right and you might say okay well extend the timer what are you doing but that's not how I think about things. I don't think about things as, okay, well, you just need more time and that's how you solve things. Everything should be solvable in the first hour. And even if that's not true, I can make it true at some way or the other, because I didn't think this was possible, uh, but it is, because it just depends on how you how you structure things. Because I know there are artists out there that can do something like this. An artist could do any of these paintings in like 20 minutes. I guarantee you there's somebody out there. So what's what stops us from trying to do that, right? Because we know it's possible. And if it's possible, let's do it. So the solution there, if you're wondering, is the idea that you put the stripes in really, really early on. And the stripes are just so embedded into the painting that the amount of actual, like, really careful value placement that you need to do on the, on the drawings is so much less. It's so much less than you would have to do for, like, a line, for instance. If this was a line, I would not be able to get away with doing just so little value work in certain areas. It would be much, much more important for me to just go in there and carefully layer in those beautiful locks of hair on the mane. But because a lot of the tiger's face is obscured with these naturally dark areas, I am saved so much time. I'm saved so much time because it already offers me the intrigue that I want, which is good because it saves me the trouble. So the solution to that idea was don't just paint something like you would regularly. Don't paint everything the same way. Paint majority, adapt your process to address the majority concern in your painting. So if the majority of your painting is dark, you paint a dark. If the majority of your painting is having stripes, it has a certain texture to it, it has a certain color to it, it's your business to start right there. You don't leave that to the end. And again, it seems really, really simple, but it's incredible. Like I've been painting for what, a year and a half, and I'm just now figuring this out. Like what the fuck? Uh, that's crazy. It's easy to gloss over things. Like what we do as artists, it's not all together all that difficult but it's a bunch of simple things that you need to always remember together and kind of like channeling that into a painting in a reasonable amount of time that's the difficult part just a bunch of really simple things that needs to be always channeled and ordered and structured um that is perfectly possible to do that i think uh, i think we can all, all do that i hope to one day do it myself but that's the idea behind uh wasted stroke i know i'm getting on some tangents here um but yeah to block this into majority it would be it would be like this i would start here something like that and you'll see me start here as well in my painting but anyway so just to summarize um again we're going to get the outside proportions we're going to get the majority shapes which are this this and this i can just roughly do something like this that's majority shape and this will be dictated by that outside contour so therefore i'll have this be roughly evocative 
of what I need. Apply the value on there and there are certain corresponding values on the painting. This is a big one when it comes to the concept of value, right? The ability to see that certain values are very similar. This is another thing that will save you a bunch of time in painting. Because when I choose the value of this hair, I am not going to choose a different value in the background. I'll just take the same value and put it here, right? So I don't lose any time in that transaction. And it's, it's a surprisingly hard thing to do. I struggle with this idea when I first started painting because I was like, there's no way I can just use that value. It looks wrong to me. It looks harsh. Uh, but it's true. And the more you do it, the better you get used to it. But the value that I put on the cheek will be very similar to the value that I put on the hair. So basically, when I paint this particular area, I'm going to paint the light here and paint the same light over here. Just to kind of save myself some time. And there's so many more of those. And the better your eye is, the better you're going to be at this idea. Like this cheek value over here is very similar to the first little value over here. You see that? It's almost exactly the same. Like I can just do that visually. This small form shadow underneath the zygomatic bone right there. Very similar to this shadow over here. You see? They're very corresponding right over there. They're, they correspond quite well. And if you just play this matching game with yourself all the time, it's going to make you so much more quicker. It's made me so much more quicker because... The amount of time you're going to spend over here is drastically reduced because you don't want to spend time picking a billion different colors and values in your painting for two major reasons. One is that it costs you time and two is that it costs you a lot of clarity for your image, right? So Marco Bucci has this great analogy about painting where he says that a painting is like composing a, a musical piece wherein if you choose every note available to you, it's going to sound like a cacophony. But if you choose selected notes and you have them repeat in like orderly intervals, you have it repeat in some structure, that's always going to help you get a better image at the end of the day. That visual clarity is just so important and so underrated, um, which is why a lot of paintings with a billion different values in the face, they don't look good. Uh, they genuinely do not look good. They don't look, uh, especially in the idea of realism. I, I know painting is subjective, but it's not a good method of painting. It's not a good way of conveying a reference. Uh, because it costs you time and it just it costs you the read as well because the values need to be sectioned off nathan fox a great painter worked for dreamworks he says that an artist should have a filter an artist is the filter you're the filter between reality and your viewer so you want to convey things with a sense of clarity and also add a bit of that flair your own personal flair to it right but it's always filtered and that's important so good corresponding values in certain areas that's really really crucial um, and beyond that, there's going to be a bunch of stuff for edges that we have to concern ourselves with later on. But the amount that we need to do is quite dramatically less. Now, uh, when it comes to edges, we have three types. We have hard edges, soft edges, and lost edges. Uh, and they are, I think all three of them are on this painting. I'll show you some lost edges right now. It's right over here, right over here, and right over here, and right over here. And I can just keep doing this because uh, there are quite a few. But the amount that you want to put in your painting is up to you. But a lost edge is basically where you can't resolve something. And this is a really cool thing. And it's one of those biggest things that kind of take our work from looking really digital to looking a bit more traditional. Uh, or just looking a bit more real, I guess. They don't look super cell shaded because um, with our ability to modify on such a crazy like cellular level in a digital painting, it's easy to kind of show everything and show it clearly. But um, a lot of the real flavor in realistic painting, it comes from the idea of hiding certain things from the viewer. And you shouldn't show the viewer everything. If everything is given the same amount of emphasis on a painting, that's going to really depreciate the value of the painting as, you know, a method of communicating a certain idea. Because think about the structure of a speech. You don't have every part of your speech, like just out of the get-go, you don't just say, all right, well, global warming is going to fuck us all up. You kind of lead your way into that, right? So you have a key point to make in the speech, but you don't make it everywhere you don't keep reiterating it you got to build it you got to you got to substantiate it you got to you know go into analogies you got to bring everything to a conclusion but not everything is given the same amount of emphasis right same thing for like a musical score or for a song or whatever there's just one part of the song that really kind of speaks to you and everything else supports that particular part but not everything can speak to you because otherwise nothing technically speaks to you right so otherwise you would call it bland right like take a, a dubstep drop for instance, like if the entire song was just drops, that would be a shitty fucking song. But if the, everything is just leads up to that drop, it drops, it's fucking crazy, everybody's going mental and, you know, their milkshakes are flying through the air, then it's like, okay, it's a great song, fantastic, I really like that song. So same idea, you want to emphasize, so this is the idea of focusing on a painting, areas of focus, areas of interest, cone of vision, all these are ideas and subjects in that particular field. So I don't want to emphasize things and in the idea of not emphasizing things, we can play around with the edge as one of the several parameters we can, ch we can change to kind of direct the vision of the viewer. So 
what happens is that we get to say, okay, I don't want you to look right there. I think I, I've given you enough information about the uh, about the shoulder. I don't need you to look over here. And the same thing, I don't need you to look exactly where this chin terminates. I'm just going to say that it does. It terminates into this conch shadow and it's up to you to figure out where it happens. Can you figure it out? Not really. But do you need to? Again, not really. And you will make a conscious decision in this matter particularly, especially if you paint from life or you paint from just regular photographs. Um, in a lot of my paintings, of uh, all of my portraits, I had to intentionally make the decision to say, okay, I'm going to lose this particular edge. And that's totally fine to do. And it's almost encouraged to do because it makes the painting look so much more painterly. Right? That painterly aspect it comes from this lost edge because a lot of the painterliness of digital paintings is lost because we, again, we try and depict every single part of every single piece that we do. And that's not a good idea if you want this particular look to the painting. Of course, there are soft edges in the transitions. One of those telltale areas of soft edges is usually around the uh, half tone. So when you talk about the principles or uh, the different parts of light on an image, uh, you have several areas, right? So you have your area of light, area of dark. Now, different, depending on who you, are, who, who you um, learn from, you'll have different names for this. But I learned it as area of light, area of dark. You have a half tone right there, you have your highlights, and you have your um, your reflected lights from your, you know, you have your balance light from different areas that you know are catching light and putting it back there. So you have the, the reflected or the balance light. And those are the components of light for any painting, right? So the half tone, which is right here, right here, right here, right here, um, just areas that are transitioning. So basically what they're saying is that, okay, well, I am in the light, I am in the dark, and this is I am in the maybe, right? I am turning away from the light. And that's a really big thing, having these half tones, that's what really makes your read much, much better. And this half tone value is something that people exaggerate a bit too much in women. I can tell you this for a fact because it's something that I used to do very, very often. Don't exaggerate this. Remember that the half tone is a member. It's a member of the light family, always. So to make that be a little bit more sensible, I can do it this way. So when you talk about a piece with simplified value, we can do it. We can just talk about it in this particular manner. We can say that for every piece that you do, you talk about the values of it, so the value hierarchy. So the way that hierarchy can be broken down is I, you can say that, okay, I want a value, a value reserved for my lights and I want a value reserved for my darks. I'm just going to put a separator right there. So I want a value reserved for my darks right over there. And I want a value for things that are in the light but slowly fading away. Usually called the second lightest light. And I want a value for my half tone. And then immediately I jump to a value called the second darkest dark, right? So do you need all these values to paint, paint a drawing? Not really. You can probably get by with two, maybe maybe three. But yeah, two is fine. Uh, it'll be a bit harsher. Three is just about perfect. You can paint anything and make it look appealing with three values. It should be perfectly fine. And the reason is because the three values are going to depict exactly what you want to depict, which is area of light, half tone, and shadow. And four values means area of light, half tone, shadow. And perhaps you have a value to, to represent the reflected light. So a much more heavily structured way of thinking about shading a drawing so when i say these values i mean you're going to paint the entire drawing with these many values and that's a great exercise to do i did it for a very long time i did it across uh, 50 60 70 pieces i did with this method and it's a great way of thinking about painting because it makes you think about the fact that things are so related to each other and it makes it, it makes it easy to kind of verify whether or not things make sense for instance if, for, for example, this is a value that's in not in direct light, right? So there's a bit of light on here, but it's not a crazy amount of light. So having a hierarchy tells me that it's not in direct light, and I have a value associated with direct light. So I can't use this value. I could maybe use this value, and most likely I have to use this value, right? So it makes you, it lets you kind of make these decisions really, really quickly and it keeps things coordinated because if I was to use this value, things would not make any sense on the painting. But then if I use this value over here, that makes a lot of sense. So this value connected to this value over here and that's what would give me, give me my read. So it makes answering questions so much more easier because if you understand the logic of what you're looking at, then you know, you only have five things to choose from, which is why value hierarchies are so, so strong. Now, I wouldn't suggest painting indefinitely with the hierarchy because, of course, as you apply more edges to your painting, there's going to be more and more transitionary values. Uh, there shouldn't be too many, but there's going to be more and more. Uh, it's just a good idea to not be super strict with it, but if you've never done hierarchy-based painting before, 
definitely jump into it because it's going to be such an improvement to uh, to work uh, if you haven't done it before because it's just a great mindset uh, to have in painting stuff because you're basically saying that I'm going to filter everything that I see into these simplified elements which is good so apply the value based on the value hierarchy maybe maybe not and then simply affect the edges so like I said it's going to be some soft edges like this transition right over there near the half tone there's going to be some hard edges for example the sides the silhouette of the face right there and there's going to be some lost edges for example right over here 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 all those are lost edges i cannot see when one shape transitions into another shape it's kind of idea. so really simple breakdown and that's all we need to do for the painting so we'll set the time for let's say how much time do i need for this one Oh, we can do this for any amount of time. Uh, we can do it for 10 minutes, 20 minutes, 30, 40, 50. I'll say 45 to an hour. Depending on, it depends on how nice I want to look at the end of it. Um, we'll say like an hour, let's say, because it's in the morning. Might have a bit of a break. Alright, I've been wrapped going since I started. I'll take a drink of water and then we'll start painting. So three, two, one, and we go. The first thing that we do is we just get that background to be nice and dark. Am I able to use these brushes for this painting? Is it gonna lag too much? I do believe it is going to lag a little, a little bit too much. So we'll just use some simpler tools today for this painting. So let's just block in the background really quickly. Generally, I don't really like it when the background is just super plain. I like something in the background, so there's a subtle little, little gradient um, because of the way that I just did that. So I'm gonna leave that gradient in. It just seems like a good idea. I'll slightly expand the canvas, give me a bit more room because uh, the piece is a little bit more horizontally skewed than I initially thought. We'll just fill it in with a single stroke, totally okay. Okay, so next step is we get that outside contour like we talked about before. So grab anything you can sketch with, I like this is fine. And then we're going to find the proportion of the piece. So basically you're looking for the outside contours of something, so we can just start with a line just about that, to be the side of the face right there. It goes flat to brow down. And the reason I kind of keep things really, really basic at this stage is because it's easy for me to kind of make verifications quite quickly. To keep things really, really basic. And it's good to kind of think about internal logic as well in the piece. And by internal logic, I mean certain things respond to other things in certain ways, right, on a canvas. And the idea behind that horribly structured sentence is that you can measure things based on other things on a painting. It's a really cool and very, very good idea to do. Measure things with respect to other things. So, for example, like how much of this face occupies this overall breadth of the head? I would say this is about a third, right? So if I was going to do one third, two third, and then three third, that's how it will occupy that much space. And that's a kind of great rule of thumb to think about when, uh, when doing measurements from eye get a bit, get about this much negative shape. So I'm not going to talk too much about the measurement process. Blockins, everybody has their own way of doing it. So mine is not particularly uh, unique to me, but uh, it's an easy thing to do, simple enough to do. Holy crap, pink eye poxy. <laughs> Welcome to the stream. My goodness, well, did my alert even go off? Welcome. How's it going, Don Lee? How's it going, guys? <laughs> my name is Indian Abroad, aka James, and I am a study streamer. I'm answering some questions that I got on Reddit uh, earlier today. Um, so I don't usually stream in this particular window, but uh, I'm very, very glad to see all of you. How's it going? Blues, how's it going? Pink Eye, welcome. Vinny, good to see you guys. So I've been painting some tigers uh, over the course of the past uh, 24 hours or so. So I did about five paintings in that time frame. And yeah, they're, uh, they're good boys. <laughs> Generally speaking, I do portraits and uh, I do a lot of metal work. You're welcome to go check out some stuff on my Instagram. Uh, I'm sure when my mods 
We'll drop that down. You look nothing like an Indiana Broad. You, you know what I look like? My goodness, are you somewhere nearby? Because I don't think my cam's on. Did I read that wrong? It's Indian Abroad. But hey, you toss enough bits at me, I'll be Indian Abroad whenever you want. How's it going, Pink Eye? <laughs> How's your stream? Would you like to post any work? I have a modest audience here, but whatever I can offer you in terms of a platform, I 100% will. I do appreciate that support. I'm not uh, entirely unfamiliar with you as well. I think I've caught your stream at least a couple of times um, before. So if you'd like to post any work, you're more than welcome to. But I do appreciate that support. Very nice of you. So sir, thank you for the follow. So what I do over here is I, I basically, you know, air quotes, teach people how to paint. I don't know all that much uh, myself, but I'm very a very big believer of the idea of disseminating information whatever you can do, right? Just point a finger in the right direction whenever it is possible. I can show you some work that we've done recently if you'd like to see it. So we've been studying the idea of armor. So I save everything that I do on Twitch and on YouTube if you want to see how I did any of these stuff. But my, my major shtick, because everybody has a shtick, right? Like they're really good at painting crystals, they're really good at painting animals. My shtick is I'm somewhat good at explaining things. So as, uh, as moderate as my art might be, you, I'll guarantee you any... I can, I can tell you exactly how I came to um, paint them uh, with very excruciating amounts of detail. So that's my thing. So I'm able to explain things and that's all I got. All I got are my words. Um, so, you know, if you're looking for crazy amounts of artwork, I can promise you maybe in a year or so, but for now, uh, at least I can tell you how we got here. Uh, I, there's a couple of armor pieces that I did. That I've been kind of focusing on uh, paintings that are a bit more like oil-like, I guess. Uh, so I've been studying some master painters in that regard. This is a study from Bulgaro. There are a few more master studies. Uh, again, on the Instagram. I don't mean to direct you guys there because I know it's a bunch of clicks and, you know, it's probably like 4 or 5 a.m. for some of you guys. I don't mean to bother you about it. Uh, but as much work as I can pull into my canvas here, I will pull it in just to kind of give you, um, you know, just give you a bit of a what's up. Your art is so beautiful. Thank you. I do appreciate that. Best teacher on Twitch. I don't know about best teacher, but uh, I do try. I do try. So. Yeah, currently I had a question on the Reddit about shapes. Now shapes is a really big subject and it's something that I really was not aware of. So I've started painting again about a year and a half ago, thanks to Twitch, by the way, if you guys know, uh, if you guys know Jay Hansen Art and Pamada K, so they had this study stream and lo and behold, I was having a terrible night at 3 a.m. in the morning. I turned on Twitch and I was like, what's this art section about? I kind of, I used to paint five years ago, let me check this out. And they had a study stream, and ever since then I've been studying daily, so I've been painting very rigorously. And I was pretty bad then, and I'm not as bad right now. And I feel like I, it's it's close enough that I remember like my first paintings, my second painting. I remember what I thought, I remember my concerns, and I, I remember my mistakes. So hopefully that's what allows me to disseminate some information that's worthwhile. Also, Jesus Christ, there's a bird outside that's just going completely insane. I'm back home in India, by the way, so if you guys want some ethnically flavored stream music, um, there's always going to be a bunch of uh, cars and cows and shit outside that are just going absolutely crazy. Bring back ballpoint sketches. I still sketch daily with ballpoint, Punta. I don't, uh, I don't post it though, but my, my sketchbook is entirely in ballpoint. Thank you for posting Pink Eye's uh, Instagram. Let me see. Oh my lord, that's beautiful. Hold on, I'm going to show people. Maybe the people in your own stream that haven't looked at your Instagram, so I'm going to force them to do so. There, this is Pink Eye's. Instagram. I'm assuming all of these are oils or acrylic. I'm going to say oils. Um, what is it in? It is oils. There you go. Fantastic. Love that warmness. I'm a big fan of saturated uh, warms on all, most paintings. Really, really good stuff. Love that bounce light. I love the way that you paint as well. You do you do the, the tiling thing the same, the, same, same way that I do. I kind of hate the idea of... Uh, over blending. You talk about um, Mark Carter, aka Draw Mix Paint on YouTube. He has a couple of pet peeves that some of them I share. And one of the first ones is the idea of over blending on a piece. I love it when you're, you're I know like exactly what you're doing over here. You're carefully selecting a value on your, on your palette, and you're thinking, okay, this might work over there, and you're reusing the value. It's a very clever painting, and it's, it's a painting that I really appreciate. So great, great job. That's Anthony Bourdain there. Rest in peace. Fantastic work. Lovely. Really, really cool. Yeah, this is right up my alley, by the way. Really, really good stuff. Did I know this? This person looks very familiar. Okay, maybe this is a random person. Hey, look, it's Steve Sketches. That guy is a great artist. He does D&D stuff. 
Um, really, really good stuff. My goodness. Big fan of that. Yeah, this is right up my uh, my alley. Uh, I'm assuming a, a lovely woman, uh, but correct me if I'm wrong. But um, yeah, after my own heart. Beautiful. Look at that oak gray saturation right there. A big fan of that color. It gets a cool diffused light on the right hand side. Really cool stuff. Those still lives were fun. I did them outside playing there. Awesome! Excellent. Can you tell from the painting that I'm a woman? A real question. Uh, no, actually, if I, I've been raided a few times by a lot of streamers, and 95% of the time when I say they're male, they're female. This is the first time I've ever said that they're female instead of male, and I really hope that I'm not wrong. Uh, otherwise, things are going to be a problem. It's a trap. A real question, and not a trap, I swear. From the painting, can I the thing is, I follow so many artists that it's really hard for me to say, like, what does feminine art even look like? Um, it's a difficult question because expertise is expertise, right? Well, not to jump on the uh, on the feminism train, I do believe heavily in equality, but uh, yeah, I mean, it's to me, it's just it's just a good artist, right? Always curious if you can tell the gender from art. I don't think it's possible, is it? Like, take an artist like Carlo Ortiz, for example. Like, look at look at her work. Like, her work is like better than ninety percent of the male artists that I follow, right? And look at somebody like Angel uh, Ganev, for example. Angel Ganev paints really cute women continuously but he's like the epitome of like a fuckboy so um not to insult you mr Ganev, i love your work I, I i can't tell personally and <laughs> it's nothing that i would want to tell to me you're just a very good artist i love the still life look at that metallic work definitely um so i actually did something like this for uh, one of my paintings a while ago can i go to my profile really quickly hey you guys want to see my instagram <laughs> now that we're here i painted a, a shit of tigers but metal work is um something I'm such a big fan of. And a while ago, I paint streamers by the way, so um, if you guys recognize some people, it's because they're all my friends. That's Shelby McBell. She has a kid, she's getting a kid. I need to give her a, a painting for her. Um... Is that weird, painting somebody for their like pregnancy or whatever, but you know, uh, I want to. That's Guilty Cosplay right there. That's um, Miss Candy Art. That's Sleepy Mia. No, it's not Sleepy Mia, I'm sorry. That's, uh, that's not... <laughs> I used to think that was Sleepy Mia. That's Give Yourself a High Five, Banff Art, Jay Hansen Art, something pretty. Ashley M. Hills, Kyuko, that's Mia, that's Nagi, that's Maddie, Tom Chi, Pam. They're all my buddies. <laughs> I really like them. Um, yeah, yeah, you guys what I was thinking about. Right, that, that this gave me so much trouble because I, I didn't understand the principles of metal. And I was just so confused about why on earth, like, why is there a blue here? Why is there a, a warm there? Like, why does it make any sense? Now I at least know. Uh, and if you guys are curious about metal painting, uh, if you look at my YouTube, there's a few... At least on every video that I've done metals, I've gone into like a breakdown of why metals work the way they do, at least in the limitations of my own ability. And if you're curious on how, like why metals look the way they do, uh, you can look at those, uh, those videos. I try to keep it succinct, but you know, sometimes I get trailed away uh, quite heavily. It was Tom T's birthday today? Yeah, I know, he did the self-portrait, he, he destroyed me. His, his self-portrait is so much better than my portrait of him. I watched you paint uh, a suit of armor. Dude, I love suits of armor. So I do a bunch of design. I'm currently trying to apply um, to a bunch of art schools to learn concept. And I've been designing armor myself and it's been just a crazy, crazy fun time. Like I designed, so one of my characters is like this dude that's in like, um, I guess it's like a medieval mecha, basically. It's a guy that's like, he's a quadruple amputee and he's in this suit and he's super evil and he's got flame arms. Let me show you. Um, I know that's a, a super like boyish concept, but uh, I've been I've been doing stuff like this, and it's just oh, hello tiger. It's been so fun, uh, kind of figuring out how things work. I've been looking at so many um, so many armor sets and kind of figuring out how things look. So this is how it, this is how the concept is. I, this is my orthographic for it, but um, yeah, it's gonna attack on Titan, I guess, but um, with the way that he's just dangling in there. But yeah, it's been really cool. There's a great channel called Knight Errant on YouTube. That dude's a godsend because he breaks down exactly what you need to understand when it comes to the armor, armor detail, you know, how people took a shit in armor. Like, just unnecessary amounts of detail. And I love that. I'm a detail junkie. Right? If you give me a Wikipedia uh, of any, like, fandom, I'll just get lost for hours. Love your stream and we'll be back. I just got a new puppy. Aww. And he needs to get go on a walk, but I will be back. No problem. 
Have a good walk. Disintegrate, how's it going? I've seen your recent uh, metal armor ones, so enlightening. Thank you. Uh, I, I did try my best. Enjoy the Bogart walk boxy. So, yeah, I, I did actually see your stream uh, online. I saw the title of your stream today. How do people shit through armor? Did they just go and shake it down, uh, shake it down their legs? No, because uh, that would probably be a recipe for sepsis and you'd die in the middle of your battlefield. Usually you would go uh, right before, but a lot of the armor could be taken off and put back on uh, most of the time in a matter of like 5 or 10 minutes, especially the later designs of armor. The initial ones were really hard, in which case you pretty much fucked. Like, you get, imagine getting stabbed in the leg and then you have fecal matter trailing down your leg as well. You're gonna die. But um, later on, the designs of armor became very much, uh, it's very, very easily, uh, you know, equipable and, you know, unequipable. Is that a word? So that was a lot easier, especially when it comes to plate mail. Like, chain mail is a piece of shit. Um, when it comes to like taking it off, but the plate mail stuff, a lot of it is attachable and detachable, so that's pretty cool. I want to see some robot concepts. Okay, I'm, I'm getting trailed off here. It's early in the morning for me, so I'm still kind of waking up. You want to see my favorite boy? You can't tell anybody about this boy, but this is my favorite boy right here. He has a giant can on his back, and he's super cute. <laughs> you know why he's my favorite? Because when I was doing my silhouettes, for some reason, this guy's leg went went this way, and he's just so happy. I haven't named him yet, but uh, yeah, this is my uh, <laughs> my art artillery diplodocus or whatever. Well, I should know better. It's not not a diplodocus. The tail's too small. Do walk to talk. Thank you for the subscription, man. I appreciate that. Unfortunately, I'm an idiot and I don't have any sub perks. But I tried to make every minute of the stream educational. So that's a, is that a perk? Does that count as a perk? Is that is that me being lazy? It's either one of the two, right? It's either I'm super lazy or I'm not. <laughs> I do appreciate that. Thank you for supporting the stream. Everything goes into tutorials and uh, just more information. So I've subscribed to so many things on Gumroad and um, and Schoolism, for example, New Masters Academy, Iron Blazes, workshops, Marco Bucci's workshops, all of that paid by the stream. And it just makes the information a lot better. So I do appreciate um, any donations and subs. That's where it goes to. So you know where your money is going, uh, if at all that was a concern. The emotes of the sub perks. So there's an emote in there. That's the emote that I made. So one of my com community members actually made me better emotes. Um, but this is the one that I made. And this is how you know that I should stick to painting realism. Thanks, Vini. Uh, it's not entirely true, though, I should point out. Um, like, if you want to make streaming a thing, if any of you guys are, are like streamers, don't ever be afraid of monetizing your work. Don't ever be afraid of like asking people for not asking but incentivizing donations it's something that you deserve most of the time right because if people are going to donate or not you know if they want to or not you leave that decision up to them but i don't use the stream to uh as like a way to kind of make money so it's never about that but it's, i don't have a problem if, even if it is like a lot of my friends are full-time streamers so okay see send non bread as perks <laughs> everyone loves non bread Could send non bread as bricks, that's true. Thank you, Boos. Okay, let's get back into the painting. Also, my voice is super rough. My dog had uh, surgery yesterday, so it's pretty... It was a pretty <laughs> iffy situation. So currently, he has a confirmed tumor, which is pretty not not okay. So um, the tumor is going to get analyzed. I'm uh, going to do a biopsy on it, and hopefully it's not malignant. Because if it is, uh, it's going to be... Uh, <laughs> I don't want to sugarcoat it. He's, he's going to die. It's going to die really soon. It's going to be not a good, good idea. So I've not been getting too much sleep. Uh, which has done wonders uh, to destroy my voice because I've been talking the entire day. So not the best idea. I don't want to bring the mood down, but uh, yeah, I'm not, also not going to hide shit. No, so how's it going? Good to see you. I hope it's not... Yeah, it, it was a dice roll to see if it was a tumor. It could have been a hematoma, but no, it was a, it was a tumor. It's a confirmed tumor. Sucks. He's only seven. He's just a young tyke. Okay. Anyway, we can go into this painting. Um, we can continue this painting, rather. Nas has a gun. Uh, did you do that? Um, you guys want to see my community, by the way? I'm so proud of these people. I'm so proud of the people in my community because these guys are killers. Let me show you real quick. So I run a study stream, so everybody's encouraged to paint along with me. And I do try and make it a good environment to, to do so. So um, all these paintings are from people in the stream, and they usually paint while I'm streaming. And they paint things that I stream, um, that, I, you know, that I explain or whatever. So we did, this, we did this bear yesterday, and this is Nos right here. So he just entered the chat. This killer work. It's so good. I think that's a little over an hour. How great is that? 
uh, all these uh, individuals kind of join me for some, some of the painting. And they're all, I'm just so stinking proud of every one of these guys. See my work in there. This is the point of the community, but by the way, it's, you know, a place to study, a place to get references. So I have a bunch of curated references. If anybody's wondering, you know, I want to paint something today. I should organize these a little bit better because right now they're a bit half a start, but all of them are good images to paint, I can guarantee you. And I've painted uh, every single one of these uh, in just about, I think. So if you would like to join the Discord, I do encourage it. All right. Let's get to this painting real quickly, because yeah, you guys can come here and listen to me we yap all day. Okay, I need to close a few tabs because your boy is running the stream off of a really shitty laptop, so I can't... If I have one too many tabs open on, on Google Chrome, it tends to destroy all that I hold dear. What ballpoint pens do you use to draw with? That's an interesting question, um, because I am of that underground rising group of youth that believe that the shittiest ball pens make for the best ballpoint art. So what I do is whenever I travel uh, to like airports and stuff like that, I'll buy like a 10 pack of like 50 cent um, ballpoint pens, like really cheap ones. And that's primarily what I use. I don't use any branded uh, branded pens. And this is like a personal preference, but I kind of like even the leaky shitty ones. Like those ones are great for sketching because I don't do intricate ballpoint work. I mean, you can see some of the work that I do on the bottom of my Instagram. Uh, but I like the ones that are really crappy, like really cheap, crappy ballpoints, because I've got some expensive ballpoints. I've never used them because they seem a bit too scratchy and the flow isn't exactly how I like. And I can't manipulate the exact amount of pigment by lifting as much. I got to press a bit harder. So I don't like any of those things. But then again, uh, I'm not a, a technical traditional expert. Um, a lot of my technicality comes from digital. so. Yeah, I'm one of those rare people that have learned how to paint digitally and, uh, and just apply a lot of the information with charcoal and ballpoint traditionally. All right, let's continue. So again, we're just marking all these features, right? So we get some overall overarching ideas. So kind of get the outside silhouette really quickly. So a lot of this is actually a bit half a start. Let's just uh, we'll just do this since people are just jump into the stream. We can just start from start fresh. That's fine. Get a fresh little canvas and we'll reset in a couple of seconds. So we've got three, two, one, and we'll reset. And now we, we begin again. Begin a new, fresh canvas full of possibilities. So we're gonna look for that outside silhouette to begin with. So we'll just do it nice and easy, right? We'll start with some basic, basic lines. And all we're looking for is that read, right? Looking for that outside read of what we see. Because ultimately, if you're able to confine things within an area that looks somewhat consistent with your reference, it's gonna be so dramatically easier. Half the time, when you don't get that outside contour correctly while you paint, Every little measurement internally is going to be a bit more awry. And the idea behind that is that you're going to measure things against other things, and that's going to create a bit of a, a disconnect between your piece and the reference. And it will create a bit of anguish in yourself because you're going to go like, well, I measured this against the side of the face perfectly. Why does it look wrong? Well, the, it looks wrong because the side of the face itself is, is wrong, right? And wrong, uh, I do apologize for some of my language on the stream. I do understand that some people have um, you know, I guess rightful chagrins, where's um, say, saying that art is good, art is bad, you know, things are a mistake, people are better than other people. So I do apologize. I'm not going to change the way that I speak, uh, but know that I, you know, I wish I could be more accommodating. But I, I, I know I, this is the kind of thinking that has got me uh, to whatever little that I have, so I don't tend to change it. But I know that a few people have problems, and I do apologize. Um, I don't mean to affront anybody. And some people are going to be like, what are you talking about? Are you saying that you, you, know, you shouldn't say art is bad? And I'm with you. I am with you. Again, I have to be considerate. See, so that's an important thing to realize. Um, like, people can have really crazy assumptions and, you know, requirements, but, you know, just be considerate. Be kind. That's what I usually try and be. And it works out. So, just a couple of lines to kind of get ourselves in, into the mix. When it comes to proportioning, the really important thing is that it's relative, right? It's a relative proportioning game. So with that respect, don't try and put the maximum amount of pressure on yourself to kind of get things right on the get-go. The way that I think about good proportioning or painting with intention is that you should have the biggest amount of confidence in yourself before you put the stroke down, right? And after that, be your biggest critique, or critic rather. Let's get some initial measurements in. This is a very common way of breaking down the face. You get the brow line, you get the nose line, that's underneath the nose, by the way, so bottom of the nose, and you get the bottom of the chin. And this is a great place to start because now we can apply your Loomis technique. 
has no Loomis, everybody throws Loomis around. You want an alternative to Loomis, by the way? Look at this guy, look at Riley. Riley's a great alternative to Loomis. It's a bit more about rhythm lines, and rhythm is like, it sounds like crystals are, you know, homeopathic re rem remedies to a lot of painters because it's like rhythm, what the fuck is that? But um, rhythm lines are, are pretty important. A lot of people respond to them quite well, actually. Like, I know a few painters that do better with rhythm than with, with strict construction. I like strict construction, I like straight lines. But um, I know people may not like it, so... Um, I like to keep things kind of open-ended. But we can do a lot of little modifications here to kind of get where we want to go. And we should be able to, uh, to proceed quite easily. So, you see me, I don't uh, intend to get a good line drawing at the end of this. I don't really care too much for line drawings. Because they're not going to benefit me at the end of the day for this piece. I'm going to be painting this piece, so in that respect, I like to keep things as a painting. So, I'm going to do something called a block-in, which is just enough information to get me where I need to go. And that's it. That's all I really care about. So if I can get where I need to go with the information that I have, that's sufficient for me. I don't need anything more than that because there's going to be a painting majority about the, about the paint, not about the lines. So right now, I can uh, do a couple of little harsh changes over here. So I'm going to get that hairline going. So I'm not perfectly happy with anything at the moment, but that's okay. That's not a bad thing, right? So finding the bottom of the lip, good algorithm to go there is I see the bottom of the nose right there. And if I can trust this, if I can trust this as a bottom of my chin, then I could just do this, right? Get get this halfway through and say that's my bottom of the lips. But I don't trust this just yet. I don't trust that little measurement. So I go to the reference and I check the distance between the brow line and the bottom of the nose. And I verify that against the bottom of the nose to bottom of the chin. And it is lacking. It's a bit less. So I take the same distance down over here and I make a new mark. Make a new mark right about there. And that's going to be my new bottom of the, of the, of the face, bottom of the chin right there. And now using this new measurement, we cut that into two. So this and this, we cut into two, we go right over there. And that's going to be the bottom of my bottom lip, right over there, right? Is it exactly correct? Is that true? Is it actually the bottom of the lip? I don't entirely know. Maybe, maybe it is, maybe it isn't. But this is called best guessing, right? And I'm, I'm, I'm not going to second guess myself continuously when I'm doing a block in. It doesn't make any sense because ultimately, the more you paint, the more context you're going to give yourself. And the more context you have, the easier it's going to be to make these big assumptions. So Mark Carter, aka Draw Mix Paint on YouTube, he has this philosophy when it comes to error checking on a painting. And he says, get as much as you can on the canvas as soon as you can. This doesn't mean you rush. It does not mean that you rush. But it means that you be deliberate, be confident, and make those strokes. And the reason he says this is because once you have everything down on the canvas, it becomes so much easier for you to make assessments about whether or not your values or your color and all the other things are correct or wrong. So you want to get to that stage as quickly and efficiently as you can, right? It doesn't mean you can make careless mistakes, right? And the better you are at like analyzing mistakes, the easier it's going to become. But it's important to think about the idea that don't like, don't make every stroke your magnum opus. Don't try to make every little value perfect. Don't kind of stick to certain areas in the painting. It's okay if things aren't completely perfect. But all right, give yourself the room to kind of make adjustments. I'm, I'm sure I'm going to make so many adjustments in this painting. Right? But the, the more I am intentional, and the more I recognize what my failings are, the less I have to make adjustments, and therefore the more successful my art becomes. Right? But I can't, be, I can't be bogged down in these paintings. That doesn't benefit me. It doesn't benefit me from being bogged down at every stage. And you'll see I'll flip every now and again, because I'm like, the flipping is really important. Very, very strong thing. So a, a little tip of find, trying to find the top of the head. Usually these eyes over here are going to be in the center. They're going to be in the center of the head. So this distance over here, if you bring that up, that should generally give you the top of the head. So I'll, I'll just follow that rule of thumb there to find the top of the head. And indeed, it's right about maybe around there is what I would say. So take this distance over here and just bring that up there, roughly over there. So in that respect, let's just kind of draw some general lines right there. I don't want to be too sketchy. And already this is a bit too dirty. I would, uh, me about four months ago would kick me in the ass right now because I'm being too dirty with my lines. Uh, not as intentional as I'd like to be. But it's okay, it's early in the morning. Give yourself a little bit of a break, right? Why you always get your throats in the abroad? Why don't you relax and enjoy painting? Isn't that what life's about? I mean, I guess you're right, but not really. Um, Kronarfi, it's good to see you. Follow Norfi, crazy artist, crazy person. Absolutely insane. Go check her out. Give her a shout out as well, there's a mod in here. Just a general facsimile of the hair right there. Oh, snaps, Indian night stream. Yeah, I guess it's the middle of the day for me, but I guess it's the night for you guys. Some of you guys over there. Which is cool, because I get to see you before you uh, 
you head into the soft embrace of slumber. So I'm going to draw some shapes right now. And since we're talking about shapes in the drawing, you see, I can be really deliberate with this. And it's still going to be fine for the painting. But I really want to design this fairly well. I need to design the shape to better evoke what I'm looking at. Something like that is fine for that shape right over there. And there's one right over here as well. Some of these angles are a bit exaggerated. I'll fix them later in post, maybe. Just shapes to evoke what I'm seeing. This is nice and simple. We're seven minutes into the drawing, and we're already almost ready to start painting. Right? Easy enough. Just nice straight lines and keeping things confined and keeping things, keeping things specific to exactly where they need to be. So I'm not going to spend a bunch of lines trying to figure out exactly where certain things are angled. Just sufficient amounts of information and then we can proceed, right? But how's it going, Mochi? Good to see you. So do I need to do any erasing at this point? Not really. I can just leave the lines as is. I will do one final thing at this stage. This is just one way of getting measurement. I don't do this uh, anymore, but I'm just doing this because it's a simpler way than what I usually do. Uh, these days. What I do these days is I do um, a, a very quick, a quick block in with a single value because I try to follow a bunch of um, oil painting processes because I like the way that oil paints look or oil paintings look. Uh, but I, I don't think it's a very, it's a super teachable, at least the way that I understand it right now. I think I, I could teach it, uh, but I don't, for this particular painting, I think it's easier just doing, doing it the usual way. Get the brow a bit forward. And I think that's, that's sufficient, right? Do we need anything more for the painting? Not really, I think it's sufficient. So now that we have the lines, I don't think this is on a separate layer, but now that we have the lines, we can do some really, really quick value work, right? So I'm just gonna take exactly what I have already. So I'm gonna do this really, really harsh, just to kind of prove a point, right? So I'll grab a value really quickly, and we'll apply that value roughly where it needs to go. This shape could have been better designed. We're we'll start right over here because it's going to be easy. Once you make these big changes, it's going to be really easy to kind of bring it back into some measure of sense. Just we'll start right there. Big, big shape, right? Big, big change. This is a big investment as well. Difficult to make this kind of this kind of thing work um, quickly, but since we have time, it's a, a little bit better than kind of beating around the bush because I want these values over there. I don't want to like beat around the bush with it uh, too much. I don't want to keep hunting for the value. Much, much easier just to put it in. At the very beginning and then we're going to work our way through the painting all right so right now i'll throw in a little bit of brushwork just to kind of indicate a couple of transitions at the very beginning i can be more methodical with it but i can let's actually let's actually be more methodical with it let's not just try and be let us be more methodical because it's easier to understand then i'm going to just get a lighter value in the face really quickly i'll make an outside selection over here you'll see me use selection quite a bit and you don't need to you don't you definitely do not need to use selection uh, at all, so a lot of my recent paintings have no selection in them, but uh, you know, it's just a fun way of working for me personally. So, I'm going to fill this up with like a lighter value. You'll see that I don't actually have my lines in a different layer, and that's totally a okay. I'm going to lighten this up just a little bit more to make sure my lines are readable. Okay, and then it's simply a question of getting a few shapes on here. So, I'm going to do this with the selection tool just because we're talking about shapes. And I really want to show you like what I'm thinking about when I paint. So generally speaking, I wouldn't do this, but because we're talking about shapes today, it's really worthwhile kind of going excruciatingly simple with the shape design. Just jump in there. Just jump in there with super, super harsh selections. So I'm just getting all those shapes in. So these shapes are going to be mostly in the dark like that. And some of them are going to go really into the dark. How's it going, Abs? Good to see you. So already we get that. You see how, how much of an immediate effect we have on the painting by doing something like that? And the nice thing about a shape is that you can edit a shape later on. Right? You can edit it to be more specific to your reference. For example, this little shape over here goes a bit bit to, bit to the front right there. This one might go a little bit higher, for example. So you're able to edit things after you, after you start them. That's perfectly fine. And the important thing is we just jump. We just jump and we start coordinating everything on the get-go. Like for instance, we have a shape right here underneath the nose. We're just 11 minutes in and we're already well on our way. Right over here. We have it on the nose right over here as well. It is, I think, something past, something past 7 or 8 in the morning abs. I haven't really checked the clock recently, but... Right over there. Easy peasy, right? We're already starting to get a good read on the nose. And I don't suggest this, by the way, if you're trying to make a finished illustration, don't use Selection Tool. I'm more doing this to try and demonstrate exactly like what the shapes are 
that I'm looking for in like a rough kind of manner. That's what's really important here. So I'm showing you like direct ideas of what the shapes are going to be. So I might draw them out, I might select them, but I'm doing this so much harsher than I really should. That's okay though, because you can still get a painting out of it and you get to see exactly what the shapes are going to be for the painting. So the way that you process this is really up to you. So you can add your shapes in first and then address your edges. I tend to, for a lot of my paintings, I tend to do those very, very, um, very much at the same time. So I'll do the, uh, the shape and the edge at the same time. But you don't have to do it in that particular way. You can easily get away with just uh, doing it one by one. Panda Perception, how's it going, dude? Good to have you back in here. How's the day going? So again, do you see that distinct shape? That's, that's exactly why I'm doing that, right? Because I want to be, I want to make this a painting about distinct, distinct shapes. I don't want to show you just how powerful they can be. Bit Monkey, Namaste. Good to see you, man. I'm back in Australia. Hell yeah, back for the art school. I cannot wait to see what you accomplish. So, I'm gonna get a really solid read already. So, again, everything is a shape, right? So we get a big shape over here for that for the eye. I can even block all this out like this, for example. To kind of get where the eye is supposed to go. I won't do that, but you can, right? How you simplify is up to you. But the, the, the point is that I see a complex face and I am not trying to paint anything complex, right? I'm just trying to paint simple, simple shapes. Like, look at the shape over here, like look at that. It's like, it's a simple, simple shape. It's just, it's just blah, 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 and blah, blah. That's it. And uh, all paintings are like that. All paintings are like that. And if they're not like that, if you don't think of them like that, it's going to be a problem. Right? It's going to be a big problem to try and make things simpler for yourself. Same thing for this shape right over here, underneath the, the nose, right? I don't want to be, I'm not trying to be perfect with this, but that's just the point, right? You see just how quickly I can get a form to read the way that I need to the way that I need to. Like, look at that nose right now. What is that? Three shapes? And it's a three-dimensional nose almost, right? I mean, one could argue saying that, okay, well, this little, um, you know what this is called in the nose? It's for you, for you nerds out there, it's called the lateral cartilage, right? This over here is called the, the greater airlar cartilage. That's called lateral cartilage. Anyway, so that's a little bit lighter because of the way it's pointed. But you see, what is that? Four shapes? And we have a good read already. Again, we can make some slight little assumptions about the light, for example. I mean, I might need a half tone somewhere over here, but for, for example, over here, I can add a shape to depict the side of the nostril. That's called your winglet, I think, or is it just called the wing? I think it's called wings, right? The wings of the nose, the things on top of your nostril. That's all you really need to do, man. Like, you don't really need to do all that much more. I think I somehow painted over my shape right there. But suddenly we have a nose that reads. Right? It reads on a very basic, basic idea, and that's the power of the shape, right? So, without any sort of notion towards the edges, without any sort of notion towards the, um, the actual, you know, value particularly, and the value is it's chosen well, but uh, even then you can get a good read by the shape, and that's why shapes are so powerful. That, that's really the foundational principle of most uh, of most painting. So we can continue with this idea, right? So we don't need to... Uh, we don't need to wait. So I'm pausing just, you know, just to kind of give you guys a good look at stuff while I uh, while I work. But for example, over here we have this little bulge of the muscle, the maw of the face. I'm just going to simplify it. I'll just say that it's the same value right over there. Same thing on the other side, right? The other side of this. So you have a muscle here around it, around this maw. It's called the orbicularis oris muscle. It kind of pushes everything out a bit more. So just like a dog, or I'm going to pause the timer here. So what we're drawing right now is this to show you anatomically what it is. So look at the face in, in profile, with the nose in there, with the mouth in there. So this entire region is pushed outwards, okay? The jaw is down there. So you have regions pushed outwards. In this outwards region, you have the philtrum, you have the top lip, you have the bottom lip, and you have the musculature around the bottom lip, and you have the, you have the, um, the chin right over there, okay? So it's a maw. Realize that the maw for a person is very similar to the maw in like an animal, let's say. So like think about, um, a, a line, for instance, right? So the, the maw for a line is a bit different. So if you draw the skeletal structure here, so the nose, it ends up right over there. And the, this is a simple for skeletal structure. You have the maxilla right over there. Yeah, you have your zygomatic bone right over there. You have your mandible right over there. So the skeletal structure underneath all of this, right? So the same way, you have the idea for, um, for a lion, let's say. So a lion maw would look like this. So we first show the skull of the lion, which is Fairly simple. So you just start with the square, right? You just put some information on the square. 
so everything kind of leans a little bit to the front but it's simple so you just start with putting in those big teeth actually let's do it a bit bit more simpler um, we can start here so the square right so it's going to be the center on the head there's going to be a break right over there right it's going to go for the nostril right over there it's going to go for the teeth the big big front teeth there's another pair of teeth underneath you have the lower mandible and you have the eyes, the eye socket right over there. You have the same zygomatic bone right over there. Go into the teeth right there. You have the molars, premolars, all that stuff right over there. And that's how a cat skull is built. So you have this kind of idea. So the same idea actually happens over here. So the lions themselves, they have a maw. You see, this is the, I'm gonna highlight this really quickly. So this is the skeletal structure right there. So you see that same kind of ridge right there? Like, do you see that correspondence? So this kind of idea goes bam, bam. Same thing here, so it goes bam, bam. And it's, it's pushed outwards, so you have these lips coming out there. So to put the, uh, the maw on top of that, right? The maw goes like this. So for, just like a, for a person, the nose goes on top of this little, <laughs> I need to, I'm running out of like opacity to work with. I'm gonna get a new brush. How about this? There you go, nice and nice and strong. So on top of the rigid bone structure, the nose comes over there. So there's a bit of a, a bump there. And then you have the greater alar cartilage. And it goes down here into the filtrum of the nose. And you have this kind of curves underneath. You have the winglets, you have the nostrils that also curve underneath. That's how the nose is built on top of the um on top of the cartilage right there, right? So the same thing happens for a lion as well. So you have the nose structure coming out there. So they have the big, bulgy, beautiful nose, man. So this is a big plane break, by the way. Do you guys study plane breaks? I learned from I learned plane breaks from Aaron Blaze, and it's like a, a really cool way of thinking about it. But it bulges out like that, and then you have the nostril for the line, like that. Right? And you have the eyes for the line going right over there. And the, you have that little bulgy mass right there. And the maw goes right over there. See how it's just building a line. See that protruding region? So the maw for the lion is this much. Right? It's like it's, it's this whole thing, right over that's the maw. But the maw for the human being is just is just this much. Basically. That much. I can't believe you've done this. Now, but if you if you understand how the bone structure works, it's really like I was a uh, very much disrespectful of bone structure when I first started painting. Cause like, why would you need bone structure? But the point is, is that like bone structure gives you rigid foundational information, so everything is kind of based on it. Because like the position of your eye socket is not going to change, right? The position of your maxilla is not going to change. So it gives you like a good amount of authority when you're when you're painting to say that okay, this is actually going to happen right over here. Like it's really important to kind of memorize that. Uh, just a little bit and you don't have to memorize it right like how did i start this i started with a box right i started with this outside box right there so that's how i kind of build up a lot of my animals and then once you understand like the way the muscles work on top of the bones and with a bit of fat information you can paint anything you want and it, it won't take you more than two weeks to learn like anything like it took me two weeks to learn i haven't learned lines but i know enough to kind of tell what i'm looking at when i look at a line painting right i kind of know what i'm looking at so once you know how the musculature is, I can say that, and the, the nice thing about it, man, the really nice thing about learning uh, anatomy for anything is that because of how we uh, originate from like common ancestors, so much of anatomy is, it's transferable, right? Like this is a human being, that's a lion, but a lot of stuff is transferable, right? And this, you can see a lot of like really unique and interesting like similarities. Like look at the way that the nose is, right? So the nose kind of breaks over here into cartilage. The same thing happens over here. The nose breaks into cartilage. You see how there's a zygomatic bone, a cheekbone right over there. The same cheekbones, I think, I believe it's right over here, right over here. I, 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 forget, I forget over here. I think it's right over here. They get the same thing right over there. You see how the incisors are there and the canines right here? Well, you have the canines and you have the incisors right over there, right? You have like these really large musculature. Like this is called the, the um, <coughs> sorry, it's called the masseter. <laughs> the, the masseter muscle, the big old jaw muscle right there. Well, you have a big old jaw muscle right here for the tiger. Oh, for the lion. No, that's dissimilar. Thanks, Sammy. Appreciate that. Trickster Coyote, how's it going, man? Good to see it. And like, even for like a horse, for example, 
like horses have the same thing and it's kind of cool for horses because it's crazy you guys have no idea how terrifying a horse actually is like you know, you know that game, game bloodborne that game like truly showed you how a horse face is fucking terrifying but this is how i construct horses oh, fuck. I can't believe you've done this. jack we've done your gal god damn it jack <laughs> uh thanks for the follow so horse construction is like this okay so you start with um with a box like that and you gotta think about a crazy amount of like angles. So I'm gonna start right here, okay? I'm gonna start with a crazy angle, right? And if you go like one fourth, two fourth, three fourth, the four fourth will just make that flat. And that's the skull, right? So the skull shape is just about this. So just how I started with the with a line. So if you think about the gestural idea of a, of a line or a cat skull, a cat skull is like this. It's very oval shaped, and uh, a horse skull is very rectangular shaped like that. So this is how you construct it. So you start with the taper, and you, at the very end, you taper it down. That's the first major plane break. And horses have just one break. And when I say break, it's important to understand what a break means. So when you're drawing anything, the real soul of something is in those breaks. So it breaks near the brow, it breaks near the nose, it breaks near the filter, it breaks near the top lip, it breaks near the bottom lip, it breaks near, on the chin, and it goes back and it breaks perhaps right underneath the jaw. And these like tell you exactly where things shift. Because why do we care about when things shift in their position, in the angle or the orientation of the plane? Because that means that if it breaks, there's no way for the majority of lighting conditions that these things are going to have the same value. Okay? And that's important. Because then it tells you how to light stuff. Right? Because, for instance, if the, if the human being was being lifted from the top, because of these breaks, you can say that these areas, for example, these areas over here are going to be in shadow. So it's a really important thing to think about. Breaks are really important. So to draw the shadow areas over here, I don't like doing this in red, but I'll give you an example. That's going to be in shadow right over there. It's going to be a shadow right over there near the cheekbone. The whole orbit's going to be in shadow, right? So you can kind of develop stuff from here. The neck's going to be in shadow right over there. So if you know where the brakes are, you can paint basically anything. Just to complete the horse idea. So the horse skull, put in that. But this is my simplification. Don't don't follow this because I don't know if it's super correct or not. Uh, it's, it's good enough to draw me horses, but it's not the best thing in the world. So you start over there. So you measure one third, two third, and three third. So at about two third is where the nostril happens. Just like this little, this little um, beak that happens here. You see the shape that happens there. A little bit of that nose bone. Horses have a crazy nose bone. It's insane. It goes all the way out there, and it goes into their teeth right over there. And I, I, I sometimes kind of like lowball this, but it goes into their teeth. Same thing on the other side. Teeth right there. That'd be a bit too high. It goes into their incisors, right over there. And you have your zygomatic bone right there. That's your cheekbone right there. Horse cheeks are really high. And you have this face plate. I don't even know why it's called a face plate, but it is called a face plate. Then I'll put the musculature on the horse, right? So you have this big old, big old masses of muscle right over there. And you have the nose that comes all the way around into the lips right here. Into the lips, lip, not, lip number one. Step number two goes back in, goes here. We have that eyes right here. Those beautiful, beautiful big eyes on a horse. Those big round eyes. Right, you have the nostril that comes right over here. I'll just put in a basic nostril right there. And you have these crazy muscles that control the lips, man. Horse lips are nutty. They're nutty lips. And you have the ears coming back here, and you have the mane and whatever. So that's how you construct a horse, right? And the masseter is right here. So we were doing the masseter in pink. But this is the masseter muscle. Look at how big that fucking thing is, dude. Like, look at how big that is on a horse. Like, these things will kill you. They'll kill you if they bite you. I mean, they should. They don't, but they should. There's muscle right over here, and the muscle right over here. That's horse, that's horse anatomy for you. See how similar that is? You see the placement? Like, it's kind of crazy. Like, I, I studied human anatomy for a long, a long time, I guess. But like, it doesn't take me all that much time to kind of develop animals because like there's so many similarities, right? Look at the pink there, the pink masseter. And for the person we're drawing right here, the masseter is right over here. The jaw muscle, right over there. It stretches across all the way to the bottom of the jaw. That's what controls the opening and closing of the jaw. Of the, uh, of the jaw. Also a bit of a tidbit, if you don't want to get laid at a bar, if somebody asks you what is this muscle right there on the eye, that's called the orbicularis oculi right there. Why I'm saying that is because we're talking about the maw, and I said, oh, here, that little muscle that controls the opening and closing of the lips, that's called the orbicularis 
um, oris, oris meaning mouth, ocula meaning eyes, so little tidbits. But again, it's some anatomical information for you. Just a bit tired taking a break from drawing to make dinner. I noticed the art man was streaming. One of my favorite muscles to say. And the, the or is aww. Oh. Anyway, that's some anatomy for you. And I, I studied this stuff um, on the side. Never had the chance to. Uh, anyway, we can continue. Shit, I have a pink on my goddamn face and I can't get rid of it. I can't believe you've done this. Okay, anyway, it's gone now. The bad man is gone. Sorry for the sabbatical. We can continue. Okay, so... Like I said before, we just continue. And all I'm gonna do is gonna mark those shapes, man. I gotta find those shapes, gotta paint those shapes, and the painting is gonna be done. So, like I said, I'm gonna continue using the selection tool because I wanna prove a point here. Like, everything is just shape. So, if you get the shape, it's all good. So, what is a shape? Somebody might ask. I might ask what's a shape because I need to know. A shape is, again, it's a two dimensional confine that depicts three dimensional forms and their response to light, right? So, it's a 2D shape representing 3D objects. How do you do that? Because 3D objects suffer light, right? They suffer the, the effects of light, which means, what that means is that some of it's gonna be in light, some of it's gonna be in dark. And if you're able to show what parts of it are in dark, which is a 2D shape, well, that's all you need to do, really. And suddenly things look like they're three-dimensional. And that's supported by the idea of good, well-selected value. Because you can't just say you can put any value in there. The value needs to be well-selected. Does it really need to be, though? See, that's the counterpoint right there. The counterpoint is to say, well, Indian, I don't need to fucking put value in my paintings. I'm an impressionist painter. And you're right. You're right. All of this that I'm talking about, all these things only uh, are super applicable to, um, to realism, right? Because there's so many ways of painting, man. I'm not going to tell you how to paint uh, impressionistic. I'm not going to tell you how to paint modern stuff. But I don't know. I don't know it. I like, I like this kind of painting. So it's the kind of painting that I, that I know. I try and get better at that, you know? So I do a lot of crits on the channel. Uh, and I do encourage you guys, if you're working on anything and you want a second pair of eyes on it, I will do my best to try and help you. However, uh, it is important to me to uh, kind of just brush up on the idea of the fact that not everybody paints the same way. I think beginners all paint the same way. But um, the more advanced you are, you're going to find like niches in, in art that you really enjoy, that really kind of speak to you. Here's my niche. My niche is I want to paint something as quickly and as basic as possible. I don't find all that much interest or all that much beauty in things that are hyper polished. In fact, I actively don't like paintings like that. Okay, so I like when the marks are just so bare bones, so utilitarian, almost lazy. I like that kind of artwork. It's what speaks to me personally. But you can be completely different and there's nothing wrong with that, man. There's nothing wrong with that. Just gotta be honest with your intention though. And it's, it's important to kind of figure out, I'm oh, sorry, I'm kind of fucking around here. I actually don't need to show that chin at all. Lost edge, remember? No need to show that chin. But um, that's actually really important to think about because of the fact that uh, if you know what you like, not just what you like, if you know what you envy, if you know what you envy, your artistic journey is going to be so much smoother and more streamlined. Reason being is that if you know what you like, there'll be artists out there that do what you like to a very high degree. Right? And if they do so, you'll be able to copy them. And you're going to be like, okay, well, some of you might be saying, I don't want to copy people, I want to be my own artist, and I respect that immensely. I can't tell you just how proud I am about your strong stance. But the point is, is that until you're where you need to go, you have a duty to learn from people. Uh, especially people that are better than you. Uh, you really have a strong duty to do this. So I learn from, I, I constantly what I do when I'm off stream is I put videos on or I put tutorials on of people that are just so much stupidly better than me. Because I'm not good. Right? In the grand scheme of things, when you bring it down to it, I'm kind of average with the way that I paint. But uh, I, I don't want to be. <laughs> I don't want to be average. I want to be good. But so, you got to immerse yourself in that kind of environment. And it helps because it, I can't go up to an impressionist painter and say, Okay, alright, I want to be a good painter. Teach me how to paint. So, that doesn't make any sense because he's not painting the way that I want to paint. So, you find somebody that you envy. You find somebody that you really, really adore. And you want to be like. And you kind of just immerse yourself in that kind of work. And I feel like that's the strongest way, the strongest thing to do. Because then you know exactly that this person is straight up better than you and you know exactly what they're doing. Indiana. <laughs> Indian average. That's good. 
you know, a while ago I wanted to start a YouTube community and it was going to be called Exceedingly Average. That was a name for it. I might still do it one day. Might be one of your YouTubers. There's still time, right? I'm 25. What's the average YouTube age? 12? Let's be honest, guys. How many of you guys, when you were younger, you made your, your YouTube video? Beastie, are you, are you going to tell me with a straight face that you didn't put a camera towards your face and say, all right, guys, my Asian parents be like, and then you have a, a, a skit or something? Are you saying you didn't have an Asian parents be like video, Beastie? Because I had one, because <laughs> I'm Indian. We all wanted to be Smosh or Niga Higa or whatever. All of us wanted to be there. I did Minecraft. I did a Minecraft video as well. I did, I did one as well. I think we all did. I think we... Uh, I don't know about you because you're a bit younger than me, but uh, yeah, we had Minecraft Alpha videos. That's what I did when I was younger. I didn't. That's because you're Chad out abs. You're a, you're a filthy, disgusting Chad. You don't sound anywhere near Indian. Yeah, I get this a lot. I am I am completely Indian though. I'm shockingly Indian. Um, but yeah, I don't I don't sound it. I'll, I'll give you that much. In college, people used to call me Andres. It's, you know, I have a very interesting way of speaking. What's funny is that I don't, uh, I don't really sound like any particular type of people. This is just how I usually. Delhi say, oh no no no, um, Mangalore say. <laughs> I was gonna say Mangalore or Mangluru, but Mangluru is in my local language. Um, Mangluru is is in Hindi. Did Chance play Yu-Gi-Oh cards and Beyblades? I play Beyblades, man. Fuck yeah. The thing is, like, I used to, um, I had a, a, an uncle that lived in Kuwait. And he used to bring me, like, genuine Beyblades. Because the Beyblades that are in my town were just so shitty. Right? They were really shitty off-brand Beyblades. And they used to just crumble if you handled them poorly. I can't believe you've done this. So, what used to happen is that you could never have a fight with somebody else, somebody else's Beyblades, because they just shatter. If you, if you had an original by yourself. But you could fight with like the cheap ones, no problem. But if you brought an original to like a cheap fight, you were, you were gonna make some kid cry. And that's exactly what I did. And people hated me for it. But I didn't mind, because I didn't have the best time growing up. That was my one time to get revenge. Is it true that the majority of Indians are vegetarians? This is true. Uh, a lot of it uh, is based on, it's for religious purposes. But uh, the more south you head, the more open this becomes. Like when I was younger, you couldn't find um, beef, for instance. You can find cow or you know buffalo meat anywhere, especially in my town. There was a big riot in my town a few years ago, actually, about this. My dad got stopped, and somebody asked him what religion he followed. Fucking scary stuff. Um, there's a Hindu-Muslim riots in my town, but um, it, this goes beyond the point. The point is, is that it's gotten a lot more modern recently. The taboo on meat, on on beef and stuff like that, is going to get a lot better. And as you head more and more towards the south, for example, where my mom's from, my mom's from Kerala. Um, there, they used to have communist op occupation in Kerala, so Kerala had a lot of uh, a lot of like a lot more open-mindedness towards the idea of con consumption of meat, which is fine. Yeah, but the issue with um, with cows particularly is that uh, Gomata, our our mother, the cow is the mother in all of our religions. So if you're Hindu, like I'm technically Saraswati Brahmin, so uh, it's in my religion as well. Uh, you don't consume cow meat because, again, it's, uh, it's considered sacred. Because, again, it's not hard to understand why. Because you can imagine, especially with a lot of the uh, a lot of families in the country being uh, in you know, rural districts, right? They're they're very rustic rural housing. Could you imagine how useful having a cow is? Because the manure is just so useful, the milk is so useful, and just having a large animal to kind of run uh, so many large like machines, uh, you know, just regular. Uh, analog machines will be so useful. It's just super, super useful animal, right? So you can understand why you would think that they're sacred. So it's not like a crazy concept to me that, you know, like, why are you worshiping, worshiping a cow? It's like, because they're fucking useful. That's why. It makes sense. It's like how some people worship technology. It's like, like organic technology to a, to a tea. Do you make your own yogurt at home? Yeah, I, I, <laughs> I was going to make a your mom joke, but that's uh, not very appropriate. Uh, do I make my own yogurt? We make curd, yeah, I guess, to a certain degree. Um, so my family has uh, an estate where we kind of live off the land there, but I live in a suburb. 
So uh, not so much of that happening right here. Usually we just buy our uh, our curd from like the supermarket or something. Curd is a weird thing, right? It's weird to say curd for um a curd to like a Western audience because you guys, I, I guess curd is like yogurt for you guys. Uh, but in India we just say curd. Curd is like what you get from uh, from milk. You just leave it out for a little bit. Curdles, right? Not exactly how you get it, but it's similar to how you get it. Okay, get this little eye in there. There needs to be a big change for the eye. Like I said, this is why we really want to consider. We really want to consider. Bitmonkey, you're from India, right? What do you say for uh, for curd when you're talking to like um, to like a foreigner? What, what do you say? You just say yogurt, right? You just say like white yogurt or whatever, or plain yogurt, I guess is what you would say. Anyway, let's get some shapes. I'm kind of um, tangenting really quickly on this painting. Let's just get some more shapes on here. It's yogurt, yeah. I guess you would know it as well, Abs, because you're from. What? The UAE, UAE, right? Anyway, let's get some uh, big shadows on here. Really quickly. Yogurt? Yeah, I thought so. So again, like, the read is there, right? For a lot of this painting, the read is already there. Now, I want to make one quick assessment, one quick correction, right? I want to be 100% sure about um, a distance between the side of the face right over here, the side of the face, this eye, the far side eye, and this side. They don't correspond exactly the same way that I, I I want them to. So a quick little fix is important. So let's get everything ready for that fix. So we'll make a general assessment and see exactly what's happening and just do a quick check to see what's going awry. So let's just fix the shape. We analyze the general impression of it. The general impression looks quite okay. So we'll analyze something specific in that particular measurement. So we look at this little negative shape between here. So I'm gonna do that a bit clearer for you guys. So right over here, side of the eye, side of this eye. And we look at that same shape. So this shape, look at that in our painting, and it's actually quite okay. It's actually not too bad whatsoever. So uh, we can actually continue with this. It's not uh, it's not too awry. I think we're quite fine. All right, so we'll continue. Just a bit of a verification right there, but that's how you would verify, right? You first zoom all the way out, and you look at the general impression of something, and then you go back in, look at some local measurements. This idea of looking at the shape in between shapes that's called the idea of looking at negative shapes, okay? So that's a really important concept in painting. So negative shape. Get, it, get some darkness right over there. Easy enough. Get this eyebrow going where it needs to go. Hey, bro. It's more organic than they are familiar with. Okay, organic, true enough. Organic is the, is the word. It depends on where you are, like how important this organic idea becomes. Like, in, like when I was working in Bangalore, then people were a bit more westernized, I guess, because they talked about, oh, I want my I want my soy latte organic and gluten-free. But in my town, like, nobody gives a shit. If you say organic, please, they're going to blink at you and then just give you the regular thing. I'm going to quickly shift this eye, just for my own sake. Okay, we'll put the other eye in real quick. So again. A lot of people, when they put the eye in, they, they do something called the eye bulge, right? Or the eye lump, some people call it, where they kind of just simplify the eye into one solid shape and they kind of work within that shape, develop the formation of the eye. And that's perfectly fine. The way that you do it is entirely dependent on you, and I don't suggest anybody do it in a way that is uncomfortable. They say the best. it is the best. <laughs> you can't, can't go wrong with it. So how you guys have the yogurt starter? We have the sourdough starters. Some of my family is, we are pretty mixed. Yeah, I know what sourdough starters are. I, I don't bake my own bread. I don't think I've ever baked my own bread, but uh, I do understand like the principle of it, I guess. Let's add an extra value here for the highlight. This is so like ramshackle because I'm just enjoying the conversation way too much. Usually I'm just talking and painting directly, but it's early in the morning, so I don't really mind. Fuck. I can't believe you've done this. Dinner cereal, how's it going? So, like I said, with these kind of faces, one of those biggest hurdles that you find it's going to be on the far side of the head, right? So this whole region over here, I'm just going to paint over it to show you. But this region is what's going to completely screw you over. If this isn't done right, then everything's going to go awry. So the way you kind of identify if things are going right or wrong from the get-go is you look at that raw shape, right? So basically what you're going to do, you're going to look at this little shape like this. You're going to draw like a, a continent around it really, really distinctly. And kind of you weigh, weigh that against what you see over here. That's how I do my measurement corrections, right? So if you get that right, things are going to be fine. So look at that raw shape whenever you can. And that's going to usually lead you 
you know, to a decent proportion in drawings. So that's called the principle of shape association, by the way. If you're wondering where I get all of my information from for measurement, it comes from a man named Jonathan Hardesty. John Hardesty is a streamer. He's an oil painter. Really, really great dude. Great person to follow on Twitch as well. But that, man, that, that man's, he knows so much about not just like knowing how to paint, but he has a great uh, teaching acumen that I really recommend looking into stuff. Just a good dude overall. He streams every now and again, and I always jump into his stream when I can, because uh, he's just a wealth of information. What's funny is that he's not like a super famous artist, I think, but a great teacher. I really owe him a lot for, uh, for teaching me how to draw a lot of things, portraits being one of them. Okay, so just doing a bit of restructuring on values. So one of the biggest mistakes you can make on the face, by the way, you can make it look less like a, like a painting, is you're gonna add a billion different values. I don't know him. There you go, that's John Hardesty. Is that DT with the shoutouts? My man right there. My man Dark Twilight. MVP. So I'm going quite slow with this, but you don't have to. Like I'm just thinking about like dal and roti and non bread right now. Got my mind on food. I had uh, breakfast at 5 or 4 in the morning. I had a very early start for, uh, for today. So, um, yeah, <laughs> I'm a little bit peckish already. Which sucks, because I don't like to be distracted when I paint. Okay. Let's be a bit more intentional, right? Because we're doing a bunch of, like, random, no like, nonsense uh, stuff for our paintings. We'll be a bit more directional. I'm going to start studying skulls as described as three creatures after this. Yeah, it's a good idea, man. Skulls are, are humongously important, and I do, do recommend whenever you can to put some time into, uh, into learning their structure, because it's going to give you so much of a benefit. So you'll find that with a lot of this kind of painting, when you paint with shapes, you're going to put down a bunch of information, and then what's going to happen after that is you're going to just try to make changes and assessments and corrections. But the thing is, what I encourage at this point, do not do that. Do not do any of that with different and like varied amounts of values. Most of the time, you're going to find a lot of success in your paintings. If you just use your same existing value structure, you use that to maximum benefit. Right? So don't keep adding values. At a certain point in your painting, just stop adding values. Just stop it entirely and use what's, ex what's existing. And if you chose your values well at the beginning of your painting, things are going to work out quite well for you. Right? It's, it's going to be a matter of restructuring things. It's always easier. It's always better as well for a painting, because you don't want to have a billion different values in your painting, right? The idea of... The idea is, is that uh, you want to always keep things structured. You don't want things to be completely awry, completely out of, out of the ordinary, because if you have a billion different values on the face, you're never going to get a good solid read on the face. Like I said, it's like, it's like composing music. If you have every note in there, it's going to be horrible. Have every note playing simultaneously, it's not going to sound very good. But it has selected notes carefully, carefully picked. So it's going to give you the uh, a really good, really good read. Oh yeah, I've been doing that, bro. Not going to lie, it's a game changer of values. Yeah, so a lot of the time, especially for a woman, right? And this is a really big, big thing to talk about because drawing women for a lot of people is difficult because if you haven't started drawing women for a long time, some of the subtleties might be lost on you. And it's a difficult thing to kind of teach yourself because suddenly you've been drawing these muscular, handsome Squidwards all your life and you need to be drawing these beautiful, supple women. And it's a problem and it's a difficult thing to adjust with. And the reason that usually is the case is the fact that we are so used to applying harsh, harsh values and harsh angle transitions with men that the second we try to draw women, it's all, you know, it's all for the birds because women have so few harsh plane changes in their face because they're much around they don't have testosterone so well, not that much testosterone so their bone structure doesn't change all that much they have this beautiful cherubic face that doesn't have extreme value changes to it generally speaking so that's usually why things go a little bit awry because people don't account for this idea you have extreme value changes things are going to read so much harsher we i don't even know when i said we but you know you're probably right I don't even know what the context of the we is. I just I just say things. I actually know this at this point. I just say things. I'm just addressing some of the edges right over here. But uh, yeah, I mean, so a few things can be talked about in this particular idea. The one is that 
you know, they choose, well, look at this value on the side of the face. This immediately I can say is too harsh, right? Because again, that's just the idea of trying to get an um, you know, easy, easy shape to my drawing. But I'm gonna put this transition value in here because I want things to be softer, right? I still wanna paint with a harsh amount of shape, but I want a softer transition because what's ultimately gonna happen here is this kind of idea, right? So I'm just gonna transition it away like that. And I kind of get the same thing that I'm looking for, right? I kind of get what I'm looking for in terms of that texture on the face. This kind of idea. And that's just about what I want. That's just about what the reference is. That's what's going to happen eventually, but when we're talking about just harsh shape, I mean, that's what we want to look for. Okay, so a bunch of things we can still change. So right now, I'm just making some little little changes, but you see that I'm not adding. So you, you don't see my, my mouse going anywhere here, or my, my mouse pointer, I guess, going anywhere there because I'm just modifying what I have on my canvas already because honestly, everything that I have already on my canvas is sufficient to finish the drawing. I don't need anything else. So I just get a bit of a negative shape right there. All right, get that mouth looking the way that it needs to. So just a, a bit of edit here and there. Get more room for the bottom lip right there. So verify some angles, for instance, so draw a horizontal line from the center of the eye down here, it gets me in the corner of the lip, so I'll draw that out directly for you, right over there, that's how I do that measurement. It's a very common thing to get this out of the mouth, it's not always going to be entirely accurate, uh, so when you're constructing your people, you don't have to do it this way, but uh, it's, it's something to think about, right? Something to think about. And we have this beautiful harsh cast shadow underneath the, uh, the lips. And again, the lips itself will curve around, so we can have a darker value right there. If you want to do this with selection, I'll select the shape for you. The shape depicts the curvature of the lip. It goes darker. And you have a little bit of a light on top. Put the halftone for that. And this goes on top to show you the, the top side of that, uh, that lip right there. Right, is enough. Get the filter to be a lighter value. I'll get this light value over here. I can cut through some of the shapes over here. Just don't put that shape real quickly. Can you give me some pointers on learning here locally at India? Or self learning through online? Or art school in India? So art schools in India are not the greatest. On my Discord, there's a guy named Spod. He's from Andhra. And Spod, uh, I think he went to like a, a mixed college somewhere in Andhra. Um, so you can talk to him about it. Because I didn't, I have never gone to school for art, so my information is somewhat limited. But online, I can tell you a bunch of things. So um, there's this place called Schoolism. They're going to have a sale uh, very soon. So it's like 200 bucks, and it unlocks all of the uh, 200 dollars. That is, and unlocks all of the information for a year. So that's one of the biggest ones. So all of the proportional stuff I'm talking about in this painting, that actually comes from the Schoolism lectures. So uh, I think it's worth it, man. I think it's worth it. So people will say all the time that, you know, all the information is out there. And it really is. It, it's, it is out there, but it sometimes does serve to have everything in one area. So I think uh, just a Schoolism subscription, not sponsored by them, by the way, but just having that is usually a good thing. Because I can't tell you how much some of those courses have helped me. I'm not going to say every course in Schoolism is great, but um, so this guy, so the course that I'm talking about specifically is this one. So it's called Essentials of Realism by John Huddesty. This is a really, really good man. It's a really good course. It's fantastic. I can't say enough good things about that course. It's really fantastic. And the other one that I would recommend is um, Designing with Color and Light. With. That's by Nathan Fox. He's a DreamWorks artist. A really good one, man. A really good one. So if you want to get individual courses on Schoolism, I can't recommend these ones enough. The second one, I will give you a bit of a disclaimer. If you don't like slow teachers, don't get that course. Uh, I don't mind slow teachers, so I'm fine with it. Uh, but yeah, just a couple of thoughts right? okay, on that subject. I was on their website yesterday and looked worth the price. I'm just waiting for the next sale. Yeah, they have two sales every year. One is a mid-year sale and the other one is a winter sale. So you have maybe a month or two to wait for. But in the meantime, definitely look online. Uh, look at so Bobby Chu on YouTube this dude He has a bunch of sample stuff that is quite good and it's the same. It's the same idea So the he'll take people that have taken the courses 
and you'll get like a bit of a taste of what the course has in store for you. And even if you just follow the assignments like barely, um, so for the realism course, I strictly follow the assignments and for my color course, I kind of strictly follow them, but I've taken so many more. Fundamentals of Lighting is also very good. Fundamentals of Lighting, sorry, I got excited there. <laughs> I got very excited. But Fundamentals of Lighting is very good, yes, I agree. So some courses that, that I've taken have been kind of like not as strict. Like I took, um, so this dude, if you're going to be an artist or digital artist, if you don't know about this, this dude, please, please, please know about him. Craig Mullins, uh, he has a course on uh, schoolism. This guy is the grandfather of concept art, basically. So he is, uh, he has a fantastic course. It's a super high level course. But even if you're a beginner, I think it's worth taking it just to kind of think about the stuff that he's talking about. Uh, very worthwhile to uh, just take it just for that information. I think it's a very cool course. And beyond that, uh, generally speaking, uh, if you just want to get into it, I'll tell you the, the path that I took. So I started with, um, with this dude because I played a lot of League of Legends. And when I came back to artwork, I remembered, oh, this guy taught me a lot about League of Legends splash art. So Kenan Lafferty. This dude has a great YouTube channel with a bunch of tutorials. I think it's very useful. Um, so Kenan Lafferty was my first uh, like video source of information. Then I went to this guy, who you all know, Proko, for anatomical information. From Proko, for painting, I went to Marco Bucci, great channel. And also alongside for design and also additional painting, there was Cycra and there was Cynix Draws. Cynix Draws, this is all YouTube, great source of information. From here, I jumped immediately to getting a bunch of tutorials on Gumroad from a bunch of great artists. So these artists include um, Greg Rutkowski. I'm not going to even try and uh, spell his name. I think it's Rutkowski. Rutkowski and a bunch of assorted artists, right? So I went to Gumroad. And from Gumroad, uh, I went to Schoolism. And I took a bunch of uh, classes over there from Schoolism. I did a few course courses on New Masters Academy. I did a few courses um, just offhand um, from, uh, I guess, like Brainstorm certified people. Took some courses on different websites, a bunch of workshops. So there's this thing called IMAG library. Uh, this I don't recommend, by the way, because it's all over the place. But it's a library of workshops that from around the world that people have taken. I've actually got some good information from this, but it's, it's too scattered. I don't recommend it for beginners. It's too scattered. Uh, I do think scattering is a problem. I think uh, it's better to give hard answers to a beginner and to give you know, soft answers to an, to an advanced person. And I'm somewhere in between, so I like soft, soft, hard answers, I guess. But I do believe in that kind of idea. Like, um, just don't uh, give too many scattered pieces of information. Kian and Lafferty from the time when Riot Games published Speed Paints. Yeah, so he's great. Uh, if you want to know more Riot artists, um, so Kian Kale is a big one, so Kian and Lafferty is a big one. Iron Stylus has some great videos, assorted ones, but they're good. So Iron Stylus. There's this guy on, on Instagram. He's also an artist for League. He's a design artist. His name is Zeronis, or Zero. He's a great artist for that kind of style. If you're looking for artists outside the style of League, uh, I mean, in the same style of League, but they don't really work for League just yet, a great person to watch on Twitch is Raiko. Is it R R I think it's Raiko, R-I-K-O. This dude, he'll stream for anywhere between like 12 to 24 hours straight. He's a fucking beast of an artist and he streams live. So uh, the VOD might be muted, but he doesn't commentate over things, but the entire process is there. So he's a great person to look for if you want to get that hyper polished look that is so common in a lot of video game art, uh, very very common stuff. Uh, this is my my road, by the way. Um, but he's he's really good to watch. He's rated me once. He's a sweetheart, and uh, I go back and forth with him for a bunch of stuff. He's just way better than me, so it doesn't make any sense for me to, for him to even talk to me. But uh, I have a lot of uh, fun watching him, and I do watch him quite often. Uh, for that same style, if you're looking for a different variation. Uh, this dude is really, really good, WLOP. Uh, I've been selling his stuff for a while, and he has like a different take on that very common cell shaded anime kind of look. Um, so if you look at this guy's work, I, I'm not sure a lot of you guys are familiar with this stuff. This is, um, I think some other artists described him as museum anime, is what he does, his art style. So it's like anime stuff that we, you would put in, a, in an art museum. It's very, very good stuff. And um, yeah, I think that's about some of the major sources that come to mind. Um, so I gave you some free stuff and some paid stuff in there. 
Hopefully that helps you out. Boro is a good one. Boro Dante, right? Boro is a good one. Boro is actually pretty new. That's why I don't think about him. But yeah, I, I do agree. Boro is quite good. Got some good chops right there, that dude. There's, there's some new artists that I don't really think about, like MDJ, for example, Modern Day James. Um, he's also another one that uh, I should talk about. But uh, yeah, this is just not like they're not uh, really established in my mind just yet. But they're very good. I don't mean to uh, claim that they're not they're not good. They're very good. I'm gonna watch a replay. Yeah, on this uh, these videos are going to be on YouTube as well. Um, I, I put the vote on YouTube after I'm done uh, with every stream, so you're more than welcome to check it out there as well. Because I, I realize that Twitch is kind of shitty when it comes to the, uh, the replays. So I'm doing some little stuff for the edges, right? So I'm going to go here. I'm using very basic tools. I'm using an airbrush to get softer um, transitions. But once I have my shape already done in the mix, I'm going on top of it. I'm simply adjusting the, that, uh, the edge. So when it comes to when it comes to drawing, and this is, I think, a pretty important thing to talk about. But when it comes to drawing realism, and this comes from the Hardesty course, by the way. So this comes from the John Hardesty course. So you can follow a pipeline when it comes to drawing, which is you get the proportions, right? You do the value and shape, you fix the edges, and then you put the color on if you want. But like that's how I kind of do all of my drawing, right? I figure out where things are, I put appropriate value and shape, I address the shapes and edges, and then I put color on there. So it's a great pipeline. And every process, and I have so many ways of arriving at so many different types of like outputs for my work but all of it's kind of following this idea of the fact that i don't want to like just do stuff super ambiguously and um yeah that's just how i like to paint i think it's a very teachable method it's very teachable i'm not saying it's the right method of painting because there's no such thing but it's super teachable which is why i tend to use it very often like i, I can tell you exactly like what to do at every stage and i like that But some art styles and some methods of arriving at a conclusion are just so ambiguous that it's like for somebody that's been learning exclusively almost for a year, it's difficult for me to kind of figure out like what the fuck's going on. Like um, when I saw Craig Mullins designing a character, it like I, I was like I couldn't sleep for like a fucking week. I couldn't understand what he was doing. And I was like, am I actually this stupid? Like, am I this far away from being a professional that I can't even understand what he's doing? But eventually, that's, uh, that's basically just me panicking. But uh, yeah, of course, it's understandable. It just takes some time. Yeah, the Mullins course in schoolism is rough, dude. It's a rough course because I don't mean to insult the dude. And it might just be because I'm bad. But um, a lot of the stuff that he teaches is just so out there and requires so much existing information that it just goes way over my head. But I still recommend it. Like I said before, I still recommend everybody as an artist, every artist in the world should watch, should at least take that course once. Because I think there's a lot of like information that could be uh, could be gained from it. I have just started with Peter Hahn. Peter Hahn is good, man. I've heard some good things about him. I've never taken a course from him, but I've heard some very good things about him. So I'm gonna mind them. There's so many artists, man. So many. Uh, and the nice thing about it is that there's, even though the information is somewhat similar, you just gotta find one of them, and then you're gonna be well on your way. Just find like one of those people that just has just good, solid information, and they're able to articulate it well. That's really all you need. Like some people are crazy enough to, to recommend like, or to preferring me over somebody like, artist or Mullins or whatever because they like the way I explain things. It's flattering. It's it's it's, it's silly, but it's flattering. It depends on you just find somebody that kind of resonates with you and you go forth so i'm using two brushes by the way for this entire drawing i'm using brush number one it looks like this and brush number two it looks like this a hard brush and a soft brush because again i'm trying to get those edges right so i'm kind of keeping it simple in that respect you don't have to keep it simple something to think about though but yeah, if you uh, if anybody needs crits and stuff like that, I, I am more than happy to uh, provide them. 
Because crits really help you. If you're an artist, by the way, it doesn't matter how good you are, how bad you are. Try and crit some stuff. Try and crit stuff. You know, even if it's stuff that you like, stuff that you hate, crit it. Like, what can you do better? What can you do worse? What was done good? What was done bad? It's good thinking. It's just good thinking in general. It'll really benefit you. Always look at work critically, man. I have this problem, and I used to have this problem much worse than I do right now. But the problem was, I would look at a piece that's better than, better than what my work looks like. I would look at that piece and I would say, oh my goodness, there's so much better than me. There's so much better than anything that I could do. How am I ever going to get there? But really, this doesn't benefit, man. It doesn't benefit anybody. Least of all you. Demystify everything that you see. Don't ever put anybody on a pedestal. Nobody's an expert. And this has helped me a lot because now when I look at like Wave Loop or I look at uh, Lop or I look at anybody that I respect and adore in terms of their, their work, I don't uh, ever consider... Well, I, I do still think, oh my goodness, they're so much better than me. Of course, how can I not? But um, at the same time, I gain things, things from looking at their work, right? I gain stuff. I come out of net positive, which is important. Can't let them win, man. Can't let them win. They've been winning too long. And of course, they deserve to. But again, if you want to bring it down to a you versus them or whatever, it's going to be your time one day. going to make it so. Oh, Jesus. Gotta be careful with that extra stroke. I'm using a, a Wacom... I'm sorry, not a Wacom. I'm using a Heon right now. Camus Pro. Let me tell you, it's a good fucking tablet. Really, really good. I know that uh, somebody... One of my moderators, actually. Vital. Got a new Heon. I think he got the 16. Or the 12. One of them. I do recommend, man. I'm so happy the Heons are out in force these days. Because, uh, God help us if we're all going to be affording uh, the Cintiqs. I'm happy that Wacom doesn't have nearly as much of a monopoly as it used to. You got the 13? No kidding, okay. I get you. Gotta head out for the night. See ya, Beastie. Thanks for hanging out so for so long. I do appreciate you, buddy. Go follow Beastie, one of my boys right there. Fellow streamer on my same streaming crew. The After Hours crew. Go check him out. You guys want to learn a couple of things about uh, the formation of those and not? Lines to paper, how's it going, man? Good to see it. But uh, I've actually been looking at this myself. Because, you know, there's levels to learning everything. There are levels to learning everything that you do. This is how it works, right? So we'll talk about like the planes of the nose. And it's good that I will do this. Good, good? Hell yeah. So it goes like this. So. We're drawing the eyes, nose, and mouth, the features of the face, right? Your absolute pinnacle, your Monte Cristo, your, you know, your, your peak, your peak things to kind of consider when you're drawing something, when you're drawing a face particularly. So everything has planes, because if, you don't, if they don't have planes, they're not going to look good on the painting, right? So you want to be able to say exactly where certain things are pointed. So when you look at anything, we try and reduce it down, we get that low poly impression of things. And it'll tell us exactly where things are pointing. So there's going to be a very important thing to consider here, which is where the planes are facing. If you're wondering what a plane is, a plane is an oriented surface. Okay. So with that in mind, let's do an eye. We'll put an eye right over here. We'll put a nose right over here. And put the mouth right over here. Okay. And we'll kind of figure out where the orientation is. So this is how we do it. Uh, this is one of the many simplifications. A lot of the simplifications that I do come from this little thing. It's called a sorrow, a sorrow simplification of the head. Asaros are little, they're costed heads that are, have all the planes really distinctly. You want to see one? I'll, I'll, I'll show you a picture of one. So let me just grab one. Sorry for my ancient mouse, but you're going to be hearing my scroll wheel a little bit. But um, Asaro simplification is a kind of cool thing because we study stuff like Loomis and we study stuff like Riley, which gives us some notion towards the structure of the head, and that's quite valuable. However, we don't really know what those planes look like. Like, we don't truly know. At least I don't truly know. Like, it didn't really resonate with me. Because I knew how to, like, place things. But I wasn't getting the impression of how things really looked three-dimensionally. And I didn't like that. So, stuff like this kind of really helps me out. Because it teaches me that, okay, well, there are certain things that look a certain way. And, uh... Did I even miss out on where this went? Actually, I have the zip file. I can unzip it again. So it tells me exactly the way that things occur in reality. Oh, there it is. It was blocked by my tablet. So this is an Asara head. Say hello, Asara head. 
right over there. So the nice thing about this is that it basically tells us where things are pointing in a very direct, no bullshit kind of fashion. That's really important because clarity is everything in a, in a painting. Jets, thanks for the sub, dude. But clarity is everything in a painting. So this is a gold mine right here because you see how distinct things are? You have front plane, you have side plane, you have side plane, you have front plane, you have side plane. It's really, really important because if these things aren't clear on a picture, the picture is going to suffer from it, right? If the picture doesn't have these components, if you don't believe me, I will... Let's pull up some mouse work really quickly, because that's a fun thing to do as well. We'll pull up some mouse work and we'll kind of justify what I just said, right? So we look at some sergeants, right? Who's better? Who's better than the sergeant? Arguably a lot of people, depending on your tastes. But if you look at a sergeant, for example, look at a big sergeant, so Henry James, right? Do you see something similar here? Do you see a, a very similar song? Look at that eye right there, right? Look at that eye. How freaky is that? You got this shape over here, depicting the left side of the ball of the eye, right? The left top eyelid. You see that shape right there, right? You see this form shadow? I'm sorry, this is form shadow on the uh, bottom lid right there. See that same thing right over there? You see that highlight caught by the top side of the bottom lid? Eyelash right over there. Sure, the arrangement might be a little bit different depending on the person's you know, age, the person's sex, the person's you know, weight, the person's form, the bone structure. So many different varied ideas. But the idea is that you can simply commit all of these into a much simpler form and it's going to benefit painting because painting is not a complex thing. Like they might look complex when you try to digest everything at the same time, yes. But especially for a painting like Sargent or for a painter like Sargent, this dude was obsessed with utilitarian representation of life. So if he says that this is the most utilitarian way you're trying to represent a form shot on the eye, you best fucking believe that, that he knows what he's talking about. So that's the kind of idea, man. That's, that's why we think about, um, about planes, because how do we draw good shapes? We draw good shapes by knowing what the planes are, because what is a shape? A shape is a three-dimensional object depicting a three-dimensional form, right? So if I know what to expect, if I know what the shape, what the um, topography is like, I'll be able to determine a shape that's best representative of how this particular form reacts to light. And I know how it reacts to light because I know where it's oriented, right? So if I know that it has multiple planes, right? If I know it has left planes and the light's coming from the right, what is it? Left plane, right source. So this, this plane, these planes can't see the source. So therefore they must be dark. These planes that are right facing, those planes can see the source. So therefore, they are light, right? So you understand where things are pointing, you understand where your light source is pointing, and then you're gonna be able to say objectively, you'll be able to say where things are in dark and where things are in light. And the way that you make that assessment depends on like how, you know, it depends on who you are really, because I've been taught this a few ways. So Jonathan Hardesty would say, okay, imagine you're somewhere on the body. Let's say you're somewhere over here. Will you be able to see the light source? Right? That's a kind of idea. They'd say that if you were standing, this is how hard he would teach it. He'd say, or, no, this is how Mullins would teach it as well. He'd say, if you were standing right over here, if you were on this lid, if you were a tiny ant man on the lid, would you be able to see the sun in this angle? Well, you would not. You know why? Because the sun's on this side, and if you looked at this, look this way, all you would be staring at, all you would be staring at is this. Let me show you. Because I have this in the side plane as well. I don't actually have a physical Asara, by the way. I should get one. They are useful as hell. But that's the principle of why we learn planes, by the way, because if you know the planes, if you know where things are oriented, that's the solution there for most of your problems when it comes to um, figuring out how to light things, right? So look at the, the plane from the side, or the, or the head from the side here. So where are we looking right now? Well, this doesn't exactly make the most amount of sense. Um, how about here? So you see that? So it's the exact same lighting condition, right? So what did we say just now? We said that if I'm going to be here, based on my knowledge about the topography of the face, I wouldn't be able to see a right-facing light source. I'm sorry, a left-facing light source, right? A light source on the right. And it's exactly correct because when I am in the position of the light source, basically, I can't see that plane because it's left facing. I'm seeing it from the right, so I can't see left facing planes. And that's basically the, the that's planes in a nutshell. 
And that's why the simplification is important, because if I can simplify something to say which which direction the planes are pointing towards, that's all I need to do to kind of light something. So with that, with that idea in mind, let's just quickly do some plane information about here. So I'll show you how I break down the planes in the head. So I'll do it very quickly. So I have one, two, three for the eyes. So left plane, central plane, right plane. I have one, two for the bottom of the eyes, left plane, right plane. Right for the nose, I have a downward facing plane. This faces somewhat downwards. That's your glabella. So your glabella, the fancy way of saying the separation between your eyes. So you see that right over there? That's your glabella. Because then you kind of feel your, uh, your brow a little bit. You can feel that this kind of depresses a little bit down. So from the side, it looks like this. So this is the eye on the side. So it, it goes inward a bit more. And then it goes outward, right? It goes outward because you have a nose bone right here. Yeah, the nose bone stops right about there. Because the nose is majorly made up of cartilage, right? So, but you have a bone right over there that kind of stops. Because when you see a skull, for example, a skull would look like this. Teeth right here, zygomatic, zygomatic. That's a skull. But you don't have a skull because you're drawing a person. So what are the, the um, parts of the nose? So we have some side planes here. Side plane here, side plane here. Those are your lateral cartilage, right? And then you have the bridge of the nose which is a central plane right over there. So it depends on how you're going to draw this. It really depends on who the artist is. So I would draw it, I'd draw it like this usually. Keep it nice and simple. So that's a greater ALR cartilage right there. And it goes into this particular point, which is a ball of the nose. Right, that's a ball of the nose. You have these winglets that come outside, come outside. This ball wraps around, so it wraps underneath. So from the side, it looks like this. It wraps underneath and it goes into the filtrum right over there you have your nostril again the nostrils are very similar like all these these three shapes this thing this thing and this thing they're very similar because they're shapes that go like this go like that basically right it's, it's a shape that wraps around so it'll wrap around like that goes all the way here and this this itself is self-wrapping so it wraps around so these are called the wings of the nose the nostrils the central point right there, it's called the filtrum. So basically this is front facing. This is this is a, a sphere almost. That's the ball of the nose right there, which is why you see over here, this is, that's why it catches a highlight right there because it's a spherical object. So you have a, a, a ball of the nose right there. This is front facing, left facing, right facing. This faces downwards, right? So this is left facing, right facing, left, right, forward. Remember that this is also left right forward but it's a sphere that's the eyeball behind that right goes into the filtrum and then you have your mouth right and your mouth's kind of cool because you have these points on both sides these are bulging points because basically this entire area is your maw and the maw itself has planes so we talked about the maw earlier if you guys have the water or whatever you can look at it early in the stream we talked about maws quite a bit of time but this is the maw we were talking about earlier right so the maw itself has a left left right left right right see this over here so it has a right facing plane and a left facing plane right so left right left right the big maw imagine like a monkey for example they have very protruding maw like they, it comes out of their face a very similar thing happens to us because we're not, we're not that far away from, from chimps we have the top lip like that lips in general they have these points that they kind of bulge outwards at so you'll see this very commonly for lips right people draw the lips like this it's a very common breakdown because what you're trying to say is that there's this tissue right over there. So it goes into the tissue right over there, around the tissue right over there. And the bottom lip, right, it goes around here. It has a lot of mass right there. It's a very common way of breaking down the nose, of breaking down the lips. So ultimately, what are you left with? You're left with something like this, right? It goes around the first circle, it goes around the second circle, right? And this usually, it hooks around like that, right? And then you have the bottom bottom lip right there. So the bottom was an interesting little problem solving area because it's a lot of really cool things that happen over here. But what I really think about for the bottom lip is the fact that this area in between, the area in between is going to have a lot of shadow. It's actually really important to kind of depict this. So the area in between is going to have just a little bit. So this, this shape is going to depend on how you simplify. So on Asaro, it'll be like this, okay? I'll do it with a different color. On Asaro, it's going to be like this. This is going to be the bottom of the bottom lip. You'll have this crazy shape. I don't know it looks really weird, but depending on how far you are on your painting, this will make more sense to you. So this kind of shape is really important because you have two muscles right over here that control areas of the mouth. And you have this divot. 
So this over here is going to be the darkest area. This will be kind of dark. This will be kind of dark. Okay. So on her, for instance, you see that form shadow over here? It's very deep because of the lighting direction. But on the Asaru head, you see that? Oh, fuck. I can't believe you've done this. See that, that same idea? This is a simplified idea of him, but basically you see this happening here. You have this area, there's an extreme shadow, and the simplified muscles from the left and from the right, right? And what's kind of cool about this is the idea that these little, this lip over here, the bottom lip, is just sitting on top of those muscles. So whenever you want to draw a mouth, don't draw the bottom lip. Like, don't do this. Because it doesn't really tell you all that much. Like, don't draw a mouth like this. Because it's kind of like, it's, it's simplifying too much. Because this lip isn't that separate. It doesn't deserve to have that line there. What makes more sense for a lip is something like this, more of the time. Something like that. Because it's it's saying that, okay, this entire lip is being pushed forward. Because you see how that kind of is mirroring your Asaro right there? You see that little line right there? What's that line telling you? The line is telling you that there's going to be muscles attaching to the bottom right there and there's a divot in between which is right over here you see that same idea because the idea that the, the misconception with having everything in the darkness is you would forget to add in this shape right over here right because again it's, it's musculature protruding outward to the bottom of the lip so this is obviously going to be in shadow because of the cast shadow of the lip itself on this side but if you don't remember how this attaches this area would look so much more incorrect. So it's important to realize that there's this musculature under there, so... For the lip over here, it's important to realize that this is going to be a protruding plane. So if I was going to structure them, red would be the darkest, and then blue would be kind of dark. And then, let's just say green would be light. If the lighting is going from top. This kind of idea. And there's a bunch of like simplified ideas in here. Uh, that I haven't talked about. There's a lot of like intricacy in here that, you know, the more you learn, the more people will talk about. For example, in the upper lip, for instance, the upper lip is, isn't exactly just one flat shape. It actually has a form to it, right? And this is more clear to us when we look at it uh, from profile, so from the side. So what is the shape of the upper lip? It goes outside, that's the philtrum right here. That's a good trivia word, philtrum, the top of the lip. And it goes inward this way. It doesn't just do this, because what I drew is just this. It's a flat line. But it actually has a form to it. It goes front and it wraps around underneath. It wraps around, and then it goes to the other lip, and this also wraps around, goes into the, uh, you know, this this little area over here, right? Let's draw that in there, and then we draw that chin. This idea. So, the see, see the thing is, I didn't draw this over here. I didn't depict it because if I did, it would be depicted like this. And what's crazy is that we see this in a lot of like close-up shots of the lips or the mouth. Because what's happening is that it wraps around. To draw the exact same red over here, because I need a value to wrap it around the lips right there. It wraps around. And you see on her, for example, you'll see this happen. Can I see it on her? Okay, look at this over here. You see this? There's a value separation right here. Even though this is in the dark, the top of the lip is in the, in the light over here, you see how there's a, there's a distinct value difference over here and over here? That's because the lip is 3D. So it wraps around and it goes underneath. You will see this in a lot of areas, by the way. There's a lot of things on the human body, they do have this wrapping around tendency. Another great place to look at this is in the eyes. So in the eyes, the, the brow region, the brow region will actually wrap around underneath the skull. Because over here, what usually happens here, is that uh, you have the skull, the orbit, which is a hole, right? It's just a hole. And you have a big brow which has tissue on it. So what happens is that this tissue on top, it doesn't just go all the way to the hole and stop. It actually wraps around, so it goes inside the orbit a little bit. So this happens. So basically what happens is that you have you know, a top facing plane, let's just say you have a, a top facing front, let's just call this front facing because it's facing front. But then you have this bottom plane that goes dark. So again, to put it on my drawing, this is front facing, right? This is bottom facing because it faces somewhat down, but then it goes underneath. I haven't drawn that yet, but it goes underneath. And then your eye comes on top. So half the time you can't see this, it's just in pure darkness. But it's good to understand that this happens all over the place. The same, so this is not that different, right? The same shapes on our lips as well. Like this would be the upper lip going underneath and wrapping around. This could be the brow going underneath the orbit, right? So, very similar. There's a lot of consistencies in most paintings. That's kind of worth thinking about. But uh, some ideas, right? Some ideas about uh, how we use planes, 
you know, how to use an Asaro head and some example of like how it's being used a lot. Like, can I just show you what I just talked about? So this is the idea, right? So it goes front plane, it goes wrapping around slowly, so you have a bottom plane, and it wraps underneath. You have this dark occlusion right there, and occlusion is an area that light cannot, uh, cannot reach in a painting. Usually the darkest region in the painting is going to be an occlusion. So the occlusion is going to be very dark, and therefore it creates an occlusion underneath the brow. That's your form right there. And the same thing on the lips, right? The lips, we have the same idea. So right now, there's a bottom facing plane right over here, but because the mouth is slightly open, the bottom facing plane, that small little plane that I just showed you with red, it's getting reflected light, and therefore it has a slight little bit of light there. So very clever, right? Very clever usage of the planes. And it shows you that this is like, this was painted in the 18, not 1800s, um, late 1800s or early 1900s, that's when the Sargent died. Um, but even then, like, they didn't have a sorrow heads, but they were thinking about planes. That's a big deal. And there's so many bigger ones, like the, the side of the face, for instance. Like, you look at this right over here. Look at the side of this face. Seem familiar to you? That little shape right there, and this little shape right here. Does it seem familiar? Because again, we're not all that different. Not all that different. So, learn the planes, man. Learn these planes, because it'll really help. Because this planes idea, it directly goes into our idea of shape, because if you know what the planes are, that's how you depict your shapes, basically. Right? That's uh, your idea right there. So you see that in a lot of my paintings as well, like I think about the exact same thing. I'd be like, okay, so I can see the, the left side of her, her lips because it's a maw, right? The the maw has a left side, it has a right side, so the light's coming from the right side, so therefore the right side goes into light. Right? This brow has a bottom plane, the light's coming from the top, so the bottom plane goes into dark. Like, be able to justify what you put on your painting. That's a kind of cool idea. And uh, I highly recommend if you guys have not studied Asaro, study it, man, it's good. If you want a course for this, by the way, if you don't want to do it by your own, um, there's a great workshop on this. It's by Bucci. So it's called Marco Bucci. I think it's called How to Paint the Head. Go to his website, go to his, like, his web store. So it's called um, Learn to Paint the Head or Painting the Head. It's two parts. I always go back to those videos, by the way. I, I go back to this particular workshop at least twice a month, at least. Because I think they are really useful uh, pieces of information right there. Very, very good workshop. Big fan of them. I have a question. Why the Asaro head is not symmetric? Okay, so this is a good question to ask, uh, and I will answer it. So the idea is, is that one side is more simplified than the other because again the the purpose of an asaro is to simplify stuff right so if you are an artist and you're just beginning to paint your drawing what are the most effective paint strokes that you can make for your painting for example so what is like the low poly version of what you're seeing so the eye in essence is this like spherical sphere with a right side and left side right the cheek in essence is one front facing plane and one left facing plane so it's a less intricate version of what you say. For, let's say you're painting a person not in the center of your portrait, but far away in the distance. How do I make that person still look like a person? I wouldn't draw every single plane. I would further simplify, right? Because this is already simplified, I will further simplify. And I'll add just one plane, two plane, as opposed to one plane, two plane, three plane, four plane, five plane. It's one plane, two plane, that kind of idea. So it's an even more simplified version. It's great to think about as well. But that's why it's asymmetric, because it gives you more bang for your buck. Because otherwise you just have two versions of the same face on both sides. But you don't need that, right? You don't really need that. This way you get a lower poly version, basically. A lower polygon count. So a much more simplified version. And that's why it's the way that it is. So it gives you like less to think about. So much more simplified forms. And you should be simplifying forms, because it helps you kind of structure things in your head much better. So that's why. I hope that makes sense. But yeah, get that booty tutorial for heads. If you're struggling with portraits, I think it's a great tutorial to use. That makes sense, Kazaki? It's a good question to ask, by the way. I don't think I've ever addressed that idea on stream. Nobody's ever asked me that question. Oh, fuck. I can't believe you've done this. Thanks, Wave Friends. I appreciate you. But yeah, that's why um, it is different. And I really suggest it, man, because the. Um, the greatest painters of all time, like, I'll, I'll pull in some masterwork because it's important, man. If you guys don't have masterwork, get it on Gumroad. Like, get some master packs on Gumroad. 
or just download some stuff from like art um, art history websites or art curation websites. It's not a pretentious thing to do, even though I know it sounds like that. I'm like, I want, do you have an appreciation for the finer things in life? I'm not I'm not trying to proselytize you like that, but it's important to realize that whenever you learn something, you look at the people that do it the best, and you say, do these people do it? Because we're not discovering, like all, all of us, we're not innovators here. I'm not, I'm not an innovator in art, right? I'm not inventing new ways of looking at things. I'm just a relay of better people than me, right? I'm a relay of better artists than me. So when I learn something from somebody, I immediately jump to my favorite artist. I jump to Sargent, I jump to uh, Rembrandt, I jump to um, all these different, like Schaefer, my favorite artists. I jump to them and I say, okay, does this idea make sense? I have made the cl made the claim, I have postulated to say that, okay, I said there, there are planes on the face. If I am able to simplify these planes, I will be able to paint more effectively. Does that claim have any weight? Do I see these planes? Do I see them in my favorite artwork? art pieces? Do I see them on all of this monster work? And the idea is that I do. I do see them on all of these pieces. Right? What we just talked about, every one of these pieces has that concept over and over again. And these are some of the most famous paintings of all time, done by some of the greatest painters of all time. right? And we have that. We have that in all these paintings. And that's so important to realize because then you have no excuse anymore, right? You have no excuse anymore to say that I'm not going to learn this. Because what do you mean you're not going to learn this? I mean, these people that spend their entire lifetime on art, they made their careers, they made their paintings based on these ideas. It's disrespectful to not do it. And of course, you can say, well, who cares about respect? It doesn't matter. And I agree with you. It's a stupid way of saying it. But the idea is, is that if somebody that spent their entire lifetime to be the best that they ever was in their craft, they probably know what they're talking about. So if they're doing something that you have just learned, maybe what you've just learned is an important thing. So going to all these paintings, the, the same thing we talked about, over and over again, you see that? What we just talked about? Over and over again, you see it, you see it, you see it. In all these paintings. And that's why we learn it. So even a concept like a sorrow, which is relatively newer, right? The, the term a sorrow head, last 50 years is what's going on. These paintings were done, I think this painting by Jules Joseph was done in the 1600s maybe. Or 1700s maybe, I'm not sure. But um, we see that idea, right? We see the modern interpretation of the idea, but the idea still lasts. This principle of planes, cannot be disregarded, it's so important. See, same idea, right? Same idea. Even, even though it's a child's face, same idea. This is um, another sergeant right there. That same idea, right? Planes. Is it left facing? Is it right facing? Where is my light facing? If my light is coming from the left, my left planes will be light. My right planes will be in dark because they're facing away from my light source. My dark values are meant to depict the planes that are not facing my light source. My light values are meant to depict the, the planes that are facing my light source. My lightest plane will be the plane that is directly facing my light source. It's going to be my lightest plane, right? That doesn't mean highlight, by the way. Uh, please have that idea in your mind. That's not a highlight, even though highlights are very bright and they're probably the brightest thing in your, in your image. Uh, it's the last thing I'm going to say before I continue painting. But remember that a highlight is a, it's a very peculiar thing because if it was going to render a sphere, Okay, sphere rendering. So I'll just grab a brush and we'll render this out. So we'll just say the light's coming from the top right, which means what did we just say. So the top right half of the sphere, the top top right facing half of the sphere, it's gonna get light. So we're just gonna get some light over there, right? So if the sphere was, you know, right over here, for example, the, the area that's right next to the, next to the light source, it's gonna get the most amount of light, correct? That's what we expect. This makes some sense to us. So I'm going to give you a bit of a caveat here, which is, show sure it's, it's being lit here, but even if the light source is coming from this angle, like, like this angle over here, it's possible, in the realm of possibility, it's possible that you get a highlight right over here, for instance. You could get a highlight right over here. Now, why is that the case? And this is really uh, common. If you were ever in a classroom like mine growing up, and all you did was you, sh you stared at your watch because your parents bought you a fancy like silver aluminum watch and it was full of highlights and you tried to like bounce the highlights onto people you'd realize something very important which is the highlight is a mobile region on the on, the, um, on any object the hi highlight is mobile meaning that it doesn't stick to one place so even if the light's falling in this place depending on the angle of viewing the highlight can change position and you're going to ask me why and the answer is because the highlight is not caused it's not something that's part of the surface, really. It's caused by the light hitting the object, 
and then going into the eye and going to your eye specifically right so as i walk around this girl the area that is in light and the area that is in shadow they're going to be the same as long as the light source is static okay but the highlight for example the highlights in her eyes that's going to change position you always see those weird statues that kind of look they follow you as you walk around the room or whatever that's kind of it's part of, it's not exactly the reason but it's part of the reason it's mostly an optical illusion uh, because it's convex but um that's that's a similar way you can think about it the the highlight will kind of chase you a little bit now it doesn't mean you can put a highlight right over here that makes no sense but just keep in mind that the highlight should not ever be used by you to kind of depict the exact direction of the light source okay yeah exactly Kazaki. then the, you'll see the highlights dance on a metal it'll dance a little bit because that's what it is man that's why it's so bright as well because this is light that's going right into the object and then right into your eyes why it's so bright it's it's worth bearing in mind because like if you don't know about planes and you don't know about um, you know this concept of highlight and how it jumps you will start to like paint every face the same and that's gonna suck for your artwork because i mean same face syndrome is a problem that everybody i guess faces because i have a big rant about this by the way i think that people that say people paint with the same face are full of shit half the time um i'll i won't go into that rant right now uh, but the idea is is that uh you need to understand the principle like what separates a intermediate from a beginner is a beginner has rules and an intermediate has principles so you can say at the bottom of the nose has a shadow and that's a that's a rule for a beginner what is the principle the principle is that the nose has a bottom facing plane and most of the, the paintings that we do have top top down light sources right so therefore the bottom plane is not going to see a top light source so therefore it's going to be in shadow that's the principle okay so why is that more important that means that if i'm drawing up a, a witch above a cauldron and she just let go of a newt's tail and created a big green explosion of light her bottom of the nose is not going to be in shadow because i realize it's a bottom plane but i can't tell you the amount of beginner paintings that i've created that wouldn't have this idea they would still put the same shadow underneath the nose right so principle over rule that's what makes you an intermediate <laughs> i want to hear the rant now we wasted too much time talking already but that's the idea if anybody's curious so principle over the rule always like there was a question on the Krita separate today about warm versus cool. I think the exact question was, how do I get better colors? How do I get better colors in the shadow? This is a big deal because it's something that I didn't know. If you guys know Sleepy Mia, she actually taught me about this idea. The key word in this rant being temperature, okay? So temperature is the key word here. So people will say, now this is the rule. Remember, a rule is used by beginners. And there's nothing wrong with that, by the way. If you're a beginner and you get offended by this, first of all, grow up. And second of all, there's nothing wrong with this. I have a bunch of rules right now that I use because I'm a beginner in so many things. Uh, like, for example, with animal uh, features and animal expression, I have a bunch of rules. I'm like, okay, if the tiger has a snarl on its face, it's going to have its tongue here, its teeth here. Because I haven't yet kind of gotten comfortable with the idea. So rules are so easy and they're so important because, because they're easy, because they're not super complex. And I believe strongly in this idea because you don't want to load people with too many like crazy ideas to start out with. Start out reasonable and then you complex, you add complexity. So the rule is, if my light is warm, my shadows will be cool. Okay, so warm, cool, balance. It's a great thing to, to give to a, a beginner because a beginner would say that if I had a light source, like if I had a sphere, for example, and I was going to light it, let's say, and it, let's just say the sphere in general is a gray color, okay? It's a gray. And we're going to apply a light to this. We'll apply a warm, beautiful, warm, golden light to the sphere. What happens? So we apply a golden light to the sphere, okay, on one side. And remember, this side of the sphere, going back to our discussion about planes, this side of the sphere is going to be in darkness. How do I show darkness in a painting? Well, darkness means it's going to be not the same value as this. It's going to be darker than this. So if this is a light value over there, I'm going to introduce a dark value and suddenly it looks like it's under the influence of light, right? It's that simple, really, really simple. What are the lights very extreme, for example, where we just increase the value of the lights and harsher lights create harsher shadows. So we have this kind of situation. Okay, well, what's the problem with this image? What is the problem here? Well, one of the biggest problems here is that A, there's no bounce light, which makes things look a little bit weird because here's a little bit of a, 
sidetrack note, but if I did this, this would very seldom exist in reality, because most objects, if not all objects, have bounce light. One of the places that doesn't have bounce light is space, the vacuum of space, which is why when the moon is under the influence of light, directional light, that's why there's nothing to really bounce back to hit the moon, which is why you only see one half of the moon. That's why it's dark like this. So that's a fun little thing to think about. But most things in reality have some idea of bounce light. So let's say there's an object somewhere in the distance and it's bouncing light back up into the sphere. Okay? And it bounces it back up and it creates just a little bit of this bounce light. Now what's the problem with this image, right? Also, I have all the fundamentals of light here, by the way. Well, almost all of them. I have... The moon is in... The moon is fake. It's not the moon landing that's fake. The moon is fake. It's, it's computer generated. But I have all the concepts of light here, right? I have... I'll write them down for you. That's my highlight, right? That's my area of light. That's my area of dark. This is my core shadow. That is my reflected light. And this over here is my half tone, right? So that's principles of, of light. Those are all the areas of light right there. Okay, so temperature. I will say that I'm going to put a warm light and a cool shadow on this particular object here. So how do I make that happen? Why does it make sense? So I'll just say immediately I want to add warm cool to this object. So let me just get my selection back here because I lost it like an idiot. Okay, let's get it back here. So I'll apply warm cool to this really quickly. Let me just fill this new sphere up. It's going to look scuffed as hell. Okay, fine, that's okay. So, we'll apply warm cool. So all I have to do over here is use the power of, uh, of digital cheating. And I'm just going to up the, uh, the cools here, right? We'll up the blue content of it. And suddenly it's like, oh, your colors look so good, holy shit. What an what a interesting drawing that you have. Right, because now you have this beautiful idea of color contrast, right? Not everything is homogenous. But why? I know it looks good, but why would I ever do this? Like, why does it make any sense in reality? Well, the idea is, is that you have separate light sources. So this looks better than this, right? One looks plain and boring, and the other one looks exciting. So temperature shifts between your warms and cools, uh, between your shadows and your highlights, or your shadows and lights, we've established a good thing, because it makes a boring drawing into a more interesting drawing, right? Again, I'm, I'm speaking in rules. I don't believe any of this because there are principles that make sense over here. But these are the rules as a beginner. So we established that we want to have, you know, warm light, cool shadow or cool light, warm shadow. Okay. We want to have those things. But why does it make sense? So now we come to the principle. Okay. So the principle is this. So in the area of light, The primary light source dominates. In the shadow or the area of dark, the secondaries dominate. So we go a little bit more complex. We talk about multiple light sources right now. Okay? So secondary dominates. So when I go outside and I am subjected to the powers of the almighty sun, because you're raw in the sky. When I go outside, why do I have certain parts of my face look cooler than other parts of my face? What happens is this. So this is my skin tone, let's say. My skin color. <laughs> Apparently I'm orange. I'm running for the US presidency. I'm orange skinned. But let's just say that's my skin tone right there. Okay? What the fuck is this thing on the side of it? Okay, we need to... Okay, hold on. That's actually really bothering me. <laughs> Can I stop from the beginning here? Get rid of this really quickly. Okay, now we're back to the warm envelope of darkness. Okay, so that's my skin tone over here. So what's going to happen? The sun is shining, maybe directly above us or to the left, let's say. The sun is nice and warm, so it's going to, what's it going to do? So nice and warm. I start over here, so warmer, right? So it goes warmer towards the condition of the sun, it goes brighter, right? Warmer, brighter. That's my sun right there. And of course you're going to say, okay, there's going to be a shadow, and the shadow is going to be just a darker version of the local color, right? Dark version of local, and suddenly I have a light source. Again, I just establish that plane, right? Establish direction using value. I have a light side and a dark side. However, we're back to square one. We're back to square one. What did we say earlier? We said, I don't want my piece to be homogenous. Well, the reason we don't think it's appealing or realistic 
is because this doesn't happen in reality. Because if you talk about the source of light in the sky, it's not just the sun, man. You have several sources. So you have the sun, of course, you have the big, beautiful, the Teletubby sun in the sky with a giant baby face. You have the sun right there. But in addition to the sun, you have the blueness of the sky. Jesus Christ. <laughs> the fuck was that? So you have the sky around here. So these are both light sources. And the thing is that the sun is a directed light source. So the sun's going to be in a particular place in the sky, shining that light directly at you. So conceivably, you can be in a position where half of your, your face is going to be in sunlight and half of it's going to be in shadow. But the thing about that is that when you consider the sky, right? When you consider the sky, the sky is going to be all around you, right? The sky is going to be all around you. So if the sun is right over here, right, in the sky, what so the sun can only see this much, right? So the sun can only see this much. But the sky, the sky is all around you in a hemisphere. And the sky can see everything. Everything in the top hemisphere, the sky can see. Okay? And if a light source can see you, it can affect you if it's strong enough. And it is strong enough, right? It's not as strong as the sun, which is why even though the sun and the sky can both see you in this particular part of the uh, orientation, in these particular planes, the sun will predominate. And therefore you only see the effect of the sun. But in the shadows, the sky, the secondary light source can come out to play. And therefore, you get a slight amount of light because it's a very weak source, but it goes bluer. And then we have that balance we're searching for. We have that balance and it goes slightly bluer. Let's say that you were playing on grass, let's say, and the grass was illuminated by the sun. The grass acts like a secondary source. So the places that the sun can't reach, maybe the grass can reach creating a tertiary light source, adding a bit of green here. And suddenly we have the colors we're looking for, but now justified by the power of principle. Okay, does that make any sense? So we have the effect of the secondaries, these primaries, these tertiaries. So that's why it works. And that's why you have warm and cool balance in all the pieces, because there are multiple light sources at play. And what one light source can see, perhaps another one cannot see. So if your primary light source creates harsh shadows, it is potentially possible that your secondary sources can see into the shadow and therefore affect it. Which is why your secondary will have a different temperature to your primary. This isn't everything by the way, there's more than this principle because we haven't talked about local color, uh, we haven't talked about um, material differences like subsurface scattering. There's so much more to the principles, but this is the primary one. Why it primarily looks the way it does. But that's like how you would go from a beginner interpretation of it, a rule, to one of many guiding principles but you realize that like what i just said all this bullshit you could you could just say well fuck it man i'm just gonna make my, my shadows cool and that's why the rule works so well because the rule accounts for a lot of what i just said and a lot more than a lot more of what i uh, what i didn't say right so that's why the rule is so important because you can't just bombard a beginner with this kind of things but as you become more advanced it's important that you learn these things it's important to learn these rules because they're going to give you so much information that's going to make your painting so much better so understand guiding principles. Also, how's it going, Bamf? Shout out to Bamf, dude. Great artist. Dude's a killer. The stone cold killer. Go check out his work. He works traditionally for you guys that are snobs in my chat about digital art, aka just abs. <laughs> my moderator's a snob. But there you go, guys. Uh, breakdown on light principles right there, really, really quickly. But um, yeah, that's the idea, man. That's what, we, that's what we're playing with there. It's really important. Who is just abs? Uh, whatever, man. Whatever your fucking name. Hey, yeah, but I hope that was interesting, man. Because I know it gets a bit too much uh, with the principles, but like that's what makes your art like. That's what elevates your art a lot. Is those principles we just talked about. So anyway, my my mouth is sore. <laughs> <laughs> at the end of that, but uh, we can keep painting. So let's continue. Yeah, but this all started with an idea about planes, right? And it's important. Like, let's just we'll, what we just talked about. We'll apply that to our painting, right? So this is going to be left facing, left facing, right source. So it's going to go into darkness, right? Just really, really easy changes. And then go into darkness right there. 
Same thing over here, right? So there's a bit of bounce out over there. But again, we have the same concept of it's going to left face, which means it goes into more of a dark right there. Kind of idea. Can you fix the shadow under her nose? It was tilting me through the entire rent. The shadow. Oh, yeah, sure. There you go, boy. I was live cheating you? Kill looking peach. Yeah, thanks. I'm doing this as a demonstration. I think this guy's gonna hate me, by the way. At the end of this drawing, he's gonna hate me because I was supposed to do this for time. But I didn't expect people to show up with questions, so I got majorly sidetracked. Shout out to India, by the way. Hope you like the Indian flavor of my streams recently. Because, uh, it's not going anywhere anytime soon. <laughs> it's got its charm to it, though, I admit. Also, this piece was supposed to be done for the hair, by the way. I just realized. Uh, so we'll get, we'll get to the hair in a second. Uh, we'll have, like... We'll just do this. We'll just kind of mess around for, like, 40 more seconds. Then we'll get to the hair. I just remembered what he was talking about for his crit. My bad. But we have a solid read for the face already, right? Pretty solid read. But yeah, we're just applying a bit of principles and we get here quite quickly. Now we can make some quick little uh, modifications to... Yeah, this was supposed to be a hair study. My bad. <laughs> I just remembered. Okay, so... Uh, a big tip for the proportions, by the way, is the idea that you want to always remember where your your inclination and your predilections are. So everybody has certain inclinations when it comes to drawing. And one of mine, and I almost guarantee this is one of yours, is that instead of having this entire plane of the mouth kind of connect down near the chin, we tend to protrude it a bit straighter. So I always look for that. If, you wonder, if you're wondering yourself, where do I, uh, meaning you, where do you go wrong or where do you have inclinations for your work, just do trace compares. And now I know trace is an ugly, bitter word to use an artist, but tracing, I don't want to trace. But honestly, don't um, don't ignore tools. Tools are important. And if tracing is going to help you be a better artist, you have a duty or responsibility to trace. So I don't mean trace a drawing. I mean, finish your painting and then trace over. And trace over your drawing and compare the trace. Compare the trace to your reference and see how, how good or how bad it looks. I don't like how smudged the top lip is, especially since it's so crisp in the ref. We can address it. In a second. Because I'm missing a highlight up there, right? I'm sure when I add the highlight in, just like the way that I did just now, we'll uh, get the Christmas back on the filtrum. You know what's interesting, Abs, uh, for the portraiture? I used to always apply highlights across the entire lip, but the more that I, I paint, I realize that this highlight actually it kind of terminates somewhere over here, somewhere in the middle. There's like a bit of a subtlety there that I've just realized, but I've just been doing it for the entire lip, like all throughout my life. Here's another subtlety, right? The corners of the lip, so even though, even though we have this idea of occlusion, and we say occlusions are very sharp in the face, right? And occlusion is gonna be one of the sharpest, hardest occlusions in the face. This side over here, so this side of the occlusion is going to be very harsh, but the corners of the mouth actually are quite soft. They're quite soft, so putting an airbrush there makes a lot of sense. So my mouths always look a little bit weird when I when I paint from imagination. That's one of the reasons why I made them way too, just way too um, harsh. The outside corner of the mouth, and there's a node right there, which makes, which is why it happens. Because this little area over here on the side of the mouth. Is actually semi-spherical uh, right there. It's a semi-spherical area right there, which is why you have a bit of softness in the shadows right there, because it's going to be a more of a form shadow on the outside uh, corners. That's the principle right there. Nostril and nose in general. Were you there when I broke down the planes of the nose jets just not that long ago? That comes from the uh, the Marco Bucci tutorial on noses, and it's super important, man. Really, really good information right there. Uh, his information is good. My information is okay. Bit of a form shadow indicating that the nose turns around. DST, how's it going, man? Good to see you. Have a good day. Bit of a form shadow there. Doesn't have to be too specific. Wouldn't be too crazy. The lip sticks, uh, sticks out and curves around, so just like the ball, the highlight will fade out. Yeah, I agree. I just gotta figure out a bit more specifics when it comes to the musculature of the auras, because the auras, I'm sorry, the um, 
yeah, indeed the Orpocularosaurus, because it kind of stops right over here. It doesn't matter on women, particularly, but I was drawing a bunch of old ladies earlier, and uh, it really matters there, because a lot of the musculature is much more profoundly, like, visible. And uh, I wanted to kind of figure out where that goes, because some of the gels and stuff like that, it really depends on where the Aorus goes. So I was kind of figuring out how that attaches. And the, my best guess right now is that the Aorus attaches right over here. So it's a bit of a space in the node, and this is where the Aorus would go on the face. That's my current idea about it. But I'll look more into it. You know, I'll come up with a better explanation. I've been listening. I'm gonna check out the tutorial. Yeah, if you want me to um, summarize it for you as well, I can do that as well at some point. Like we did for the, uh, the brushwork. There you go. You get a nice little read on the face right there. Shall we uh, do this hair, by the way, because we've been lacking? Let's do the hair, because I've been I've been mucking around enough. Okay, so we'll do a couple of things to simplify. So I'm going to grab a shadow from up there. And we'll actually um, slightly include a form shadow on the uh, eyes right there. Just a bit of a form shadow, just to kind of up the read of that beautiful, beautiful lost edge right there. I don't want to make it too soft. I'm retaining a lot of hardness in the face, because I like the, the way it looks. The way that our germ would uh, classify this idea of edges in the drawing is that if everything is hard, nothing is hard. If everything is soft, nothing is soft. Because all these concepts come from relative, relative painting, right? From understanding that things are relative on the canvas. A dark is never truly dark. A light is never truly dark. Uh, truly light. It's really, it's light compared to. It's dark compared to. These are the ideas that we kind of work with when we paint. It's all relative concepts. So for this neck over here, I think I'm sufficiently happy with just having just you know just one value down there. I don't need more than just just this value. I think I'm happy enough keeping it the way that it is. I had a sick idea. What if you took uh, took a picture of your sketchbook and flushed it out in digital? It'd be a cool effect. Could do it. Yeah, you could do it. I don't really uh, work traditionally in a way that kind of allows that because I'm very sketchy. Uh, but yeah, I mean, I could I could try and do that. That wouldn't be too bad. Okay, so again for the hair, we just apply the simplification that we did before. So I know what I need to have here, right? I need to have these areas that go into light, just like this. So basically I can do it with two strokes, or I'll do it with multiple strokes because why not? So I get that light area right there. And it gets broken, it gets broken into a few pieces, because again, some areas are gonna dip, because these are individual locks of hair, and some of the locks might go more into shadow than others. So we painted some shadows right there. Looking at the form of it, so we blur our eyes, get a big assessment of it. So we have it going into shadow right over here. One, and two, and we'll just say three. It doesn't have to be perfect, right? We can get a read. So I'm doing nothing for the edges right now. I'm simply addressing the shapes, right? I'll put a shape over there to describe this beautiful large lock of hair. And I can update the shape for it to be a little bit more evocative of what I need. And by update, I mean I can add in a curve right over there. And add in this idea, so give it more of a curvy shape right there. It's not really a curvy shape, really, because it's not, a, not particularly... I mean, it is a curve, but I'm drawing a two-dimensional curve to describe a three-dimensional curve, which means that it's skewed. But I put in that curve, just like that, nice and harshly, right? And I can modify the shape depending on if I was too overzealous with some of the design right over there. That's how I think about that. So I'm doing it as harsh as I possibly can with selection tool. But again, I wouldn't, I wouldn't do this if I wasn't trying to emphasize shape design in this painting. At this stage, I'm going to zoom all the way out. I can make a little bit of a change for the outside edge, for example. Just bring that in a bit more. I have a habit of making the hair a bit too large sometimes, so I want to be a little bit careful about that. I'll throw a shape down there for a bit of a highlight. And then down here, I just want to address this whole area. I'll just redo it, because it's in darkness. So I'll get rid of this really quickly. I'll quickly mark out where I think it needs to go. So it needs to go about that far away from the hair on top. And it has something like a zigzag pattern. I'll apply some light to it. Just like that, right? And I'm gonna get some darkness in between to kind of signify the locks. So again, I'm doing this with a very basic brush. I'm gonna pull out a, a couple of brushes just to save some time in just a second. But this is basically the read of it, right? The read of what we're gonna draw. So just simple, simple shapes inside of the head. Easy enough. So we'll take this one step further. We'll add an additional value here, an additional value to depict the form shadow, right? Or to depict the half tone, let's say. Right, so I'll throw in a bit of context here. So how about right over there? Right over here, because it's, it's curving around, right? So when things curve around, you're going to tend to have a bit of a half tone on there. 
So right over there is going to be an appropriate region for it. And probably right over here as well. You see it curves around? And if it curves around, it's going to have half tone. Always. And you see the second I start adding it, it becomes more and more possible, right? It becomes more and more possible for this to be hair. And not just arbitrary amounts of, uh, of value. And this is really the idea, right? That we just talked about. We talked about the idea that you select your shapes first. Right? You get your shapes well designed. You put your values in there. And then you address the edges, right? You address the edges. That's exactly what we're doing right now. So suddenly you're more like hair than we ever were before, right? And we can amp this further. There's a further thing we can do here. I'm gonna lose that on this, I'm gonna lose that on this edge over here, on top of the head, because I don't need it. And down here as well. These lines are kind of spooky. We'll get rid of them. Okay, so now we're in a better shape right now, right? So we've addressed the shapes a little bit. So again, everything has been done with selection tool and with this brush so far. Let's introduce our soft edge into the painting because there's a softer edge right here because of the value in the brush. There's still a harsher edge right here. It's too harsh to depict what's happening over there. Because remember, it's transitioning slowly into shadow. So I'll bring my airbrush, the edge looks like this. Okay, and I'm gonna address the edges really quickly. So it goes softer, softer, goes into the hair. Okay? I'll leave a little bit of it right over there, but it goes softer. So this is the idea. So I get these subtle, subtle transitions. Set of idea, right? And suddenly we have all the components we need. So then it's just a matter of going back and forth, back and forth, and designing the shapes a bit better, adding a little bit of detail. But we don't need to do that for this painting because I can just go back to this initial stage and I'll do exactly what I just did. But I'll do it with brushwork. Okay, so I'll pick a brush, the brush looks like this. And sort of paint in, same idea. But the brush has a tooth on it, and the tooth lets me get three amounts of detail for the hair. Right over there, for instance. I can simplify over this area if I, if I wanted to, if I needed to. I'll throw a little bit of extra value down there. Beautiful, beautiful lights. You see the edge right here? It would be incorrect to say that this edge here is a hard edge. It's not a hard edge, it's a semi, it's something we would call a firm edge. Because it's not a super harsh read. Because when you blur your eyes, it doesn't just turn it immediately. Because this to me is much harder than this. So it would be a mistake. It would be a mistake for me to paint this edge over here on the face with this kind of edge. It would be a big mistake. So I need to make this softer somehow. So I can do so by either just softening it up with some additional lines towards the side. You see that? It softens it up. I could do something like that. I could even just make it a manually softer edge by using an airbrush, also possible. I will just do this for the time being. I'll just paint in a bit more to make it semi-soft. See how much it's adding to the painting? What is that panda? Could you explain that for a second, just while I paint? Since we're about four minutes away from completion. Is that an artist I need to, need to check out, maybe? I'm just adding to the painting. So beautiful. Same thing over here. I'm applying that same soft shadow that I did with the airbrush before, but I'm just doing it with a brush that has teeth on it, that's all. A bit of a toothy brush. Right, so we just, we're here right now. We're gonna apply a little bit of, um, of value, just to get some additional Little points of interest right there. Right over there, let's say. Right over here a little bit. Just some additional pieces of information. When the sergeant was talking about value in one of his books, he talks about this um, this transition region between the light and the shadow, and he says the purpose of the shadow is twofold. The first is to give you Solid information about the direction of the light and the interface between the shadow and the light is meant to give you information about the material property of your object, which is why you see so much of the work that artists do for establishing temperature, I'm sorry, establishing um, texture, 
is done in the transition, right? Because you have this area of dark and an area of light. And the only thing you need to really tell somebody what they're looking at is to address the transition a little, a little bit more. Just a bit of information and suddenly everything is set into stone a bit more. It's really powerful stuff. There are some harsher, darker lines in between. Those are occlusions caused by the hair. I'm just painting a few of them in. I'm using a third brush here. It's a harsher brush. To give you an idea, that's one of the brushes. And this is the softer alternative. So I'm using these two brushes for the hair. This is perfectly possible, by the way, without any brush whatsoever, but it just takes a bit more time. And it probably would look better if I straight, if I straight paint and everything, but it would take more time. So I'm sacrificing it a little bit for some clever brush work. I'm sacrificing a little bit of... Uh, my own pain and suffering. Let's use a fun little brush for the size of the image. Use a screen tone brush here. Which just basically this is what it looks like. And you would think where on earth would I use this brush? But it adds like a fun bit of noise to paint things. I like putting it towards the corners of, um, of the hair in certain areas. I like that noise, it's fun. The same thing would apply to uh, some of the brushes that I use for my oils. And if I was going to paint the entire thing abstractly, you would see a lot more of that painting, a lot more of that uh, particular brush. But I'm doing this quite strictly, so not as much on this particular painting. Again, just have to address some of the shadows here. Look at things that are quite consistent. Right over there. But you see, we developed this hair in like, in no time whatsoever. What is it? Took us like 10 minutes, I guess, to get here. And we're in good shape with hair already. So even though all of this was very inefficiently done, I mean, we, we, we got to the finish line in the, in the required time. We said one hour and one hour in, we're bang on there, right? Which is pretty cool. So yeah, just principles, man. Just principles. I like how Ben addressing this dude to the entirety of the, uh, of the commentary. But he was nice enough on Reddit, so why not? Let's be nice back. Of course, there's some car shadow nonsense happening to the elbow, I'm sorry, the shoulder, but I will choose to just neglect it, we'll forget about it right now. Just add a form shadow right there, add a little bit of motion towards the light, and we're done, nice and simple. There was a lot of explanation in the middle of that, there was a lot of talks about a whole variety of subjects, um, so I do apologize if it was a bit helter-skelter. Uh, but overall, I think everything that we talked about was is going to be helpful uh, to make paintings like this in the future. So hopefully, you don't mind too much. I don't want to over soften the face. I always hate it when that happens. Yeah, and for post stuff, you're more than welcome to just go in there. A little bit of light. Use a modification tool. And just dab in a little bit of light if you think it's appropriate. I won't do this very often. But just, you know, just if you want an additional oomph in certain areas, it's perfectly okay. To get it closer. That's a fun little thing that we can do. You just amp those highlights and now I'll just call it done. The one minute and about one hour and about three minutes. I don't like how harsh that is. I actually have a big pet peeve about highlights. I don't want the highlight to be too bright. But it's almost, it makes my work a little bit worse because since I'm always trying to not make it so bright, I tend to make it a bit too dark sometimes. Nice. Okay, well, that's, it. that's it for our first painting. Had a lot of fun with that. Like okay, I'm actually having a bit of a pet peeve here. Go move that a little bit down. Now, this entire painting was done on one layer. So from start to finish. <laughs> I'm just fiddling around with it right now. There you go. Good enough. Cool.
So of course a bunch of things that we need to fix with the proportion and all that stuff, but you know, for what it was. I'm uh, more than happy with this painting. What's fun? The release is select. Yeah, I know you. I knew you were gonna say something about that. <laughs> I knew you were gonna say something about that. <laughs> you know why I did it? Because I knew. Okay, we'll call the shapes. Hopefully, he does appreciate that uh, that brief tutorial. But yeah, that's actually what I came online to do, by the way, uh, today. It took a lot of time because we answered a bunch of questions, but this was just to kind of give that one guy an answer to his question about shapes. Also, a bit of a caveat to this: once you uh, once you finish your like your big work, uh, putting in all your all your, all your uh, major shapes, it's perfectly fine uh, to go back in there and throw in a little bit of detail. In fact, it could be a really good uh, thing to do. Just to finish the painting off, just a couple of lines at the very end. There's a the bot. Hey, Amps, ban that bot. If you don't ban him, I'm gonna ban you. So it's perfectly fine going back in here and throwing a couple of these lines here, just to give more context and a little bit of uh, a little bit of information at the end, a bit of context information. And help the read sometime. There you go, buddy. Good job. <laughs> All right, let's re-export this. But I think that covers a lot of stuff. <laughs> I think that covers a lot of stuff. So hopefully you guys enjoyed this video, oh, and hopefully um, you guys enjoyed this little painting with all the all the topics talked about on the side. Like there's so many proportional issues that I haven't like gotten into here. Because again, I just want to jump into the painting here, but. Yeah, it's not too, uh, it's not too game-breaking. Cool, I'm really happy that all of you guys showed up, by the way. That are raiding everything, that's kind of cool. I was not expecting uh, anybody to even show up today. But I guess the fact that I'm such a degenerate and I've streamed just about every hour in the day, at one point or the other, there's always somebody or the other online um, always stops by, which is kind of cool. Okay. Well, we're going to call it right over here. Hopefully this was educational. Uh, that's the major aim of the stream. But I'm probably... Before you go, go to Sketchbook Share and tell me which design you like the most. Okay, let me see. Mr. Bot, have I? How dare you, DT. Disrespectful. Dude, Para, nice job, dude. Para did this painting along with us. I think it's solid work. Good stuff, dude. Really, really nice. So, your shapes are already looking pretty good on the uh, on the hair. So, just kind of, uh, if you want to know exactly how I got to the look that I have, you know, you can, you're welcome to just look at the uh, the board again. But I hope um, I hope what I said makes sense because you're already well on your way because your shapes look fine. There's your positions of them. And your values are not too bad either. There's just a bit of a correspondence you missed over here. So the same value I would expect to see on the hair. But then it's just a matter of putting in maybe one extra value for the uh, for the form shadow. And then putting a bit of context on there. Except I spent the whole time while you were teaching. That's totally fine, don't worry about it. I think I love your your proportions. They look pretty solid. Good, 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 good job. <laughs> I was gonna say good, good damn job. But that's uh, something that my mom would say. She would say good, good damn. A good goddamn. It's a very South Indian thing to say. A good job, dude. Alright, let me check your designs. What you got? Okay. Old man, tribal outfit slash tat, futuristic city. Okay, so that's your, um, I'm assuming your, your guiding um, idea. Your inciting uh, principle, your inciting ideas. I think I like this one the best. Number four. It seems the most, because you're kind of going for kind of a storyboard narrative moment. And everything else doesn't really scream out to me all that much. It's between four and three. Uh, I think three would be great if you want a character focus. Four would be great if you want just more colors in general. But this could be a great uh, piece to explore. You remember that, that piece we did a while ago, Abs? With the guy with the uh, with the lighter? 
lighting a, a cigarette or a cigar near his face. He was in like a sailor outfit. You could use that reference over here because it's a very similar condition. And you could really bring out the colors and the features of the face in this kind of painting. Uh, this one would be better if you want to, want to practice some landscapes and you know, get more colors in general. You know, now that I think about it, just because I've painted something like this before, it's a very rewarding thing to do uh, because it demands a lot on the artist, a lot on your ability to kind of convey the human form uh, with respect to a new light source. So this would be a great, uh, a great ability test right here. But this would make a good piece. Everything else looks crap. Uh, not uh, compelling enough. The perspective on this would be interesting to do though, but just because the perspective is interesting doesn't mean it's going to be a good piece. Yeah, these two. My, my vote is for this one over here. That's my choice. Cool stuff. Alrighty, boys and girls, we are going to call it. Let's go find somebody to go send some love to. Let us raid. Who's it going to be? Jen, Grim, Norpheus. Young Warrior. Shaky. Ooh, Shaky. Hmm. Okay. How do we raid somebody new? I did a close-up portrait recently, so I'll do the city. That's totally fine. Really okay. Let's, uh, let's raid Jen. I would hang around at Jen's quite often these days. Go send her some love. It's been a ridiculous stream, by the way. Holy shit, guys. 14 follows? What the fuck? And a bunch of subs? You're insane. I was actually expecting to just... I, the way I... If you go to the very beginning of the stream, by the way, the way I began it, it was like a very traditional like YouTube video start to the stream. But uh, thanks for making it a great stream. I do appreciate that. Got a crazy uh, raid from Pink Eye Epoxy, I believe it was. Go follow her if you haven't already. Um, but yeah, I do so appreciate you guys accompanying me to this little paint over. Hopefully that the person that required it. Who was the, per who was the person that asked for this stream, by the way? What was his name? Um, Radio Runner. Hopefully you appreciate the tutorial. <laughs> and uh, thanks so much, for, uh, you guys, for asking the questions and for helping me run. Thanks to you, thanks to you the mods, for, uh, for always being on duty. Uh, I'll ask for better individuals to help run the stream. And yeah, I will see you guys over at Jen's. Be kind to her. Go give her a follow. And I'll see you tomorrow for some more studies. Cheers.